and I'm going to tell five minutes uh, before uh, the end of each allotted time, uh, uh, the speaker that he needs to wrap up. So, so at least they are going to have five minutes, but if they wish, they can stop earlier. This is okay with everyone. So, uh, without further ado, I am welcoming Henry Schumer, who's from Lancaster, uh, and he is going to talk about instability and sensing in uh, non reciprocal uh, non Hamiltonian topological media. Welcome, Henning, and uh, please uh, tell us about uh, these nice things. Okay, hi, hello, everybody. I see many familiar names in the, in the window. Hi, Pablo. You could not make yourself visible, unlike Elsa, but I, I know that you are there. Um, so, okay, and um, thanks to Lazzi and Alberto to inviting me for this session. I really enjoyed um, yesterday morning's session, um, and there were many nice talks. What I realized is, um, so I was a condensed metaphysicist a while ago, but in some ways I transformed a little bit into an optical physicist. And um, the idea of this talk will be to have um, a little bit of an introduction into this field as well, as I have a little bit more time. So the talk <clears throat> will be made out of three parts. The first one is um, on the theoretical side, what I'm going to talk about is situated in the field of non-Hermitian topology. And um, that is a field which originated from the topology that many of, uh, of us uh, already know for a while now, but um, there are some differences. And I just want to highlight some differences so that we have a level playing field and know what we are talking about. Then I will talk about some of my earlier work as a motivation for this particular talk. And um, the, the context will be to go away from the more mathematical questions about non-Hermitian topology and think about physical applications. And the most interesting ones, which are actually intimately tied to some mathematical notions of topology, as I will explain, is what is a topological source and what could be a topologi topological detector. And in which way can a source be different from a detector? And then this leads me to the main part of the talk, where I will explain how sources and detectors really differ from each other if you look at so-called non-reciprocal media. And for, for many of you, it's early in the morning. For me, definitely it is. And I thank my sponsors, Coffee, for um, getting me through this. But um, if, if you're in a similar situation, the main takeaway message would be that there are some media that you can excite on one side, and they're very sensitive on this side, but they reply and um, their response is on the other side. Um, this is how you should think about the system from a theoretical perspective. Of course, physically, if you look at this picture, this looks like a directional amplification mechanism, which would be sort of the physical sort of um, or ap applied uh, way to think about such systems. Okay, let's start with non-Hermitian topology. Um, let's start with topology. And um, the great thing about topology is any topological effect so easily transfers from one type of system to another type of system. And um, I just highlight this for two brief examples. One that we will see a lot during this talk, and this is a Su Schrieffer Heger model. This is um, originally a carbon chain with double bonds and single bonds. So these dots are carbon atoms, electrons, conduction electrons can hop from one of these atoms to another. And in a simple tight binding system uh, ap uh, approximation, you have a unit cell with two sides that is repeating periodically. So you get a two by two block Hamiltonian, you get um, two eigenvalues as a function of the, uh, of the wave number and you get two bands. And you get a gap, of course. So this looks like a little bit of a semiconductor and now the interesting thing is um, actually depending on whether you have the strong bond or the weak bond within the unit cell, you have two different topological phases. And if you join them up together in the middle so that you have a, like an extra side in the middle, you will have an extra state. And this extra state is special in many different ways. Um, 
two of which I think all of you know. One is it's an interface state. So if you plot it in space, it's localized at the interface. The other one is its uh, energy is zero. Is there where none of the bulk states can be. There is a third thing, and that is um, that the amplitude is only on every second side. And then this is coming from a sum rule, basically, because you have sort of fused an extra side into the system. And this is something that, um, that uh, we will uh, exploit actually as we go along quite a lot. So now this sort of system, for instance, can be easily transferred into the mechanical context but just building a system where you have some levels of different lengths and then you get these mobile defects. And this is a really very close analogy to the original quantum context, including that this defect here can move, which in the original context was just a change of the dimerization pattern by changing the double bonds into single bonds. Uh, you can do something similar there as well. So just, um, to give you another example of this transferable aspects, you can take the quantum Hall effect, which has this um, wonderful edge states, which gives you the quantization of, of the Hall conductance, and you can transfer it again to optical systems. But now this is a little bit more complicated because for this you have to break time reversal symmetry. And um, this was sort of engineered into the original first uh, experiments, but um, this is actually not so easy in optical systems. Um, so here it was done by separating two spaces of, in momentum, so never having any back reflection by just building the components as it is. But in principle, it would be nice to break the time reversal symmetry in optical systems in more profound ways. As I will explain a little bit later, once you talk about these optical systems, the notion of time reversal symmetry is bifurcating. There are different notions of time reversal symmetry. And one, which is the first one that I want to address, is the one of gain and loss. Of course, if you have gain in the system, a signal might increase over time, uh, which is the opposite of decreasing over time, which you get from lossy. So you gain and loss can break symmetries. And um, to connect it to notions of topology that we are familiar from electronic systems. Let's see what it is um, doing to symmetries. You can do this in two steps. And the first step is just to look at the symmetries that you already exploit and see how they become modified. And then have a look at um, whether you already actually did physics of that kind in the past and whether it just naturally falls into the scheme. So the topological physics um, in electronic systems you know, there's this periodic table, which is um, built on the altland Zirnbauer um, tenfold way. And this is underpinned by three symmetries, where time reversal symmetry is just one of them. It's reverting the motion of particles at a given energy, um, just like mapping some op operators, if, if you like, to their complex conjugate. Then there is the so-called Carrel symmetry, and that's the one which you see in the Sushrifer-Heger model. It uh, maps particles going in one direction at one energy to the opposite direction at uh, the negative energy from the conduction band to the valence band. And then you can, of course, combine the two, which you find in superconductors, and then you get this possibility of pair up um, two particles moving in the same direction um, at two different energies. So these are the three symmetries um, expressed mathematically. Um, Time reversal symmetry is at the same energy, and the other two um, symmetries um, actually put a minus sign in front of the whole Hamiltonian, and therefore also the energies. So, if you look at physics that people have done, in particularly optics, for the last 10, 15 years, the time reversal symmetry for gain and loss, this is a really huge field. It's called PT optics. And uh, what you to do is to maintain this property but your Hamiltonian might be complex. So um, modeling gain and loss, you often do by a complex scalar potential. And that gives you some um, states which have different lifetimes. So in the complex energy plane, you have some states which have a positive or a negative imaginary part. But with this PT symmetry, they would always appear in pairs. Okay, so this is a huge field already on its own and it already exists. The smaller field, but um, there are works on this, 
is to do build optical systems with gain and loss which have this symmetry. Now this is still maintaining zero energy which is a certain reference frequency in these systems as a special reference point and then you have a scatter of um, resonances in these systems which are symmetric to this but you can have an accum accumulation of states which have the zero energy and then the one related to superconductors is uh, particularly interesting for us because what it does, it's like having the extra minus sign in front of here. It's like a PT symmetric system, but rotated 90 degrees in the complex energy plane. Now you still have some states which have um, potentially a fixed real part of the frequency, which is what you really see when you look at a device, the color of the device will be protected, but also the option to then manipulate the lifetime of these states. So this was the first um, little step. Then, um, and, and this is an example. So you can use the Su Schrieffer Hegel model. You can put some gain and loss into the system, and then you will find um, that you still get these bands. If you don't have the defect, um, they will be at real energies. Initially, if the gain loss contrast is not too large, you have a PT symmetric system. But including the defect, you get an extra state, which is actually not paired. So it's not a PT symmetric system anymore. If you check with this gain and loss, just on-site potentials, which are complex, you have a structure which is actually this charge conjugation symmetry. And that means that there can be a state in the middle which has a different lifetime. If you do it like this, the simple um, extensions, you typically find that the topology can just be maintained. You just have to redefine your winding numbers, for instance, in terms of expectation values. And this is just a little plot to show how, how it goes. So very briefly, um, you can, of course, um, revisit this whole from a more mathematical perspective, and then you find a whole zoo of other effects. So, so far, I told you about just extensions, but where is the new physics? So part of the new physics is to say this was actually not a complete picture. Once that your Hamiltonian is no longer Hamiltonian, you actually have a doubled notion of all these symmetries because where you have H, you can pay, put H dagger, where you have H complex conjugate, you can put H transpose. And particularly this notion here is very important. So this is a time reversal symmetry that you break by gain and loss, but with balance gain and loss, you might still preserve it in interesting ways like in PT symmetric systems. This is what you get from magneto optical effects, basically vector potentials, and perhaps also non-Hermitian vector potentials, so-called imaginary vector potentials. But uh, actually, uh, so if you break this symmetry, your system becomes non-reciprocal. In optics, you have actually two words. You have time reversal symmetry and reciprocity. And mathematically, they differ in this way. So if you do this systematically, you find not 10, but depending on how you count, 37, or I think 38 or 43 different classes. And, um, but what, you, what is much more important is that you find a lot of new phenomena, uh, topological phenomena, which don't exist for electronic systems. So this is a very short list. First of all, your cherished um, diabolic points, the Dirac or Weil points in, in different systems become so-called exceptional points. They, in the complex plane, basically, they change their co-dimension when you had a point, that it becomes a ring. If you would reduce the dimension by one, you get again the point, which is the so-called exceptional point. And, um, and this is just a, a sketch from experiments. But um, this is a concept which is around in physics actually for 50 years. Um, but it becomes central for these non-emission systems. The notion of a gap actually changes because you now work in the complex plane and this is just one attempt which I want to briefly mention. Don't worry about the details. I give the references here if, if you want to see that. But of course, in the Hermitian system, closing a gap means you have to go through a point. In the complex plane, you might also refer to a point or you might refer to a line. And then you would like to exchange the rest of the dispersion relation um, with respect to these points. And this is actually also linked to these exceptional points, which I mentioned. Um, so this is not independent. And you get these um, funny new types of dispersions actually very, very easily. So you can take uh, a resonator chain, 
of just like um, um, circular resonators, but make them lossy and um, um, distort them a little bit so that they're not um, rotationally symmetric anymore. Then you have these uh, waves that go into opposite directions. They are coupled in different ways, A and B. Uh, so this becomes a simple type binding model. And if you work out the dispersion relations, you find these um, complex branches. So the real part might look like this, as I had exactly in the sushi for Heger model. But if you change now the difference of these couplings in basically momentum space, because these are uh, propagating waves that are coupled here, then you can get these complex branches. Um, so the, this is still a very brief list of phenomena. Um, but for instance, then if you couple two of them, you get defect states. And this would not be possible if you had started from the emission system in the plane of these couplings A and B, when they're the same on this diagonal, there you are in the emission system. If you go away from the diagonal, you can find these situations where you have defect states. And again, they are born by these exceptional points, these deeply non-hermission spectral degeneracies. So um, they are born in exceptional points on the real axis, which means that the time reversal symmetry is playing a role, or PT type of symmetries. And then they disappear again on the imaginary axis, which is this non-hermission version of the charge conjugation symmetry in superconductors. So you suddenly see effects in in 1D, if you were look, to look into the symmetry in this table, periodic table, no defect state should be uh, possible to appear. But uh, in the non hermitian case, this is simply not true. And, and the reason is that in these systems, basically the bulk boundary principle breaks down. <clears throat> and um, the most dramatic effect of this is in so-called non-reciprocal systems, as I mentioned. Um, and this is actually an experiment that I will, will um, discuss a little bit later on. So I, I know time is precious, but uh, I will be fine. So you can build systems which has, have these directed um, components. And uh, when you wiggle them, the response is very strong on one side. So mathematically, they have directed couplings. They're like a sushi for Heger model, but with directed couplings. And what it does now is basically not making your com Hamiltonian complex, but it's not uh, invariant under transposition anymore. So the Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian, is not the same as it's transposed. And, um, and then you see these effects like this amplified, uh, directed amplification. And what it tells you is that you really have to rethink response theory. Okay. So this is the, the background and part of the motivation of my talk. Uh, how are we doing with time? Um, okay, so when we want to think about response theory, then we want to think about our systems physically as sources or detectors. Then we want to excite the system and see how it responds. And then we want to look at um, how the response looks like. So we detect the response by looking that at what is coming out, which is like a source. And, um, and um, for me, very important is what for me personally was the realization that this is actually something which is already built into our notions of topological systems. Actually, if one goes back to how topology was developed in physics, then a certain notion of response was already fundamental. And this is related to anomalies. So if you take the schrafer heger model and you break the so-called Carre symmetry, which is, is behind here, and you look at the defect state, then it, because it only sits on one sublattice, it's only moving in one direction. So it breaks the symmetry in parameter space. If this was a Bloch Hamiltonian where delta is just a parameter which depends, for instance, on another momentum, you get an edge state which is propagating in one direction. It's still the same effect. And um, if we do this in our complex models, then instead of the real part of the energy following the, the, the real and imaginary part, is actually the imaginary part. And this explains why this defect state, um, as I mentioned before, uh, has a different lifetime. So it's moving up. It's on the real axis, but it can move up and down and you can tune it. 
Now, from the physical um, perspective is, this means you can probe the system by putting gain and loss, and it will reply in a very particular way, namely it will become a laser, where the defect state is the lasing state. So this is how the system becomes a, a, quite a cute detector of pumping by replying with a topological state. And um, this has been seen in experiments, first uh, with microwaves. This was done with my friends in Nice. So they built uh, a system with microwaves where you have some microwave disks with long and short couplings with a defect state, putting some, but um, it was done by just putting some losses on every second side. And if you do that, you find a very sharp spectral peak at the bare resonance frequency of a single detector. And if you do that in the time domain, you find a filtering effect. If you put in some, some radiation without the gain and loss, you'll find some speckle around the state that you excite. And this becomes a much nicer propagation if you have the, the losses in the system. You can build lasers out of this. Actually, this has been done with my friends um, in, uh, with uh, Feng and, and Co. two years ago with a very, very short system. And I just uh, flashed the slide in, in view of time. Uh, and I'm flashing a few more slides just to tell you that this phenomenon is, is of course very universal. You can build systems in two dimensions, like a leap lattice where you have a flat band and then you can uh, filter out the states in the flat band by putting these elastomer patches on every second side. Again, you get very spectral, sharp spectral peaks, which are basically the topological response of the system. You can do it uh, with excitonic systems, which I did with my friends in Sheffield. So these are some already a bit more quantum systems with uh, built with pillars and pumped. And um, if you pump very hard, then you get a very sharp response in these flat bands again. And um, then there are some ideas to build some other lasers, uh, flashing this very briefly. Um, so the last basically few minutes, 10, 10 minutes or so, I, I want them to reserve at um, going through a world example. So we're coming to the third part and really the main part of this talk. <clears throat> so I showed you that there is a lot of mathematical notions and things are not fully settled with this non-Hermitian topology. It becomes very complex with um, these different types of spectral degeneracies and different types of bands and the breakdown of the bulk boundary principle. Then I told you that these systems reply in particular ways um, already with this little video where you say, saw this um, directed amplification. And I talked about this topological mode um, selection mechanism where you can pump a system everywhere, well, in a certain pre preserving certain symmetries, say on every second side, and it will reply in a topological mode, which is not where you pump exactly, but it's at a defect state. Um, but these systems were still reciprocal, these lasers. So the quality of a source on a, on a very fundamental level is still the same as the quality as a detector. Um, so if you look at the quantum noise, um, these two things would be indistinguishable. And what is more exciting are these um, systems like in this little video where you have directed amplification and this so-called non-Hermitian skin effect where, where um, bulk states pile up on one side um, just like in this directed amplification and you have unidirectional transport. So let's look at the physics of this and see where um, the difference of the source and the detector is actually encoded. So the little video that I showed um, uh, was a so-called robotic meter material. And the video that I showed was um, the system was built to highlight the bulk effects of the system. So, sorry, you wiggle somewhere in the middle and then you get this expansionally skewed response to the side. Now, there's another experiment which people have done, uh, which I think is still not yet published, but it's a wonderful experiment. Um, and there they built the system in a slightly different way so that you get a topological zero mode as well. So it's again built um, out of um, mechanical components. These components are active. They have some act 
actuators which reply to the angle and then try to kick the system uh, more in one side than the other side depending on the um, on the angle that you're at so it's like a system with springs but uh, with a different kind of uh, force from one component to the other than in the other direction and um, the equations of motions are actually very simple they're still like a coupled chain of harmonic oscillators with a certain dynamical matrix but the secret is that this dynamical matrix is no longer symmetric. So maybe recall at initially I told you that if a matrix is symmetric, this is reciprocity. Now here you have a non-reciprocal mechanical medium. Um, and now actually, if you look at the, the way that this mathematics works out with this particular configuration, the other aspect which is important is that if you write this Q times R, the Q and R are sort of defective matrices. They are not square matrices. There's one row missing. Now, if Q and R would be the transpose of each other, you had a reciprocal system, but in the experiment, this is not the case. And if you now transform this uh, set of equations of motions into one uh, first order differential equation, you double the dimensions, you get an effective Hamiltonian, which is no longer symmetric. So you can look at the dynamical modes. The frequencies um, are the eigenvalues of this matrix, um, or the, uh, the squared frequencies are the eigenvalues of the matrix M. This is really just the same thing. But if you look at it uh, through this effective Hamiltonian, you will find that there's always also a zero mode solution. And this is uh, because of this um, dimensionality of the matrices. You have one less constraint than variables if you try to solve these equations. So you find some finite solutions. And um, the really fascinating part is that they can be localized at opposite edges. So this now just depends on the difference of um, couplings epsilon. If epsilon is large enough, you might have a schrafer heger model with a weak bond for the Q matrix at one side and the weak bond for the R matrix on the other side. And this will give you zero modes which are uh, localized on opposite edges. So now in the experiment it was done so that the modes that you can see, the so-called right eigenmodes, the, these U's, can change from the right to the left. And that will tell us that the response of the system can change to the right, from the right to the left. But um, the sensitivity, as I will explain, this is uh, related to the left eigen mode, will always be um, distributed in the same way over space. And there I wrote, already told you the answer. This, uh, this is actually, um, I, I learned about these experiments in a uh, talk by Jasper van Wesel a year ago. And at that time, people didn't know what was the role of the left eigen modes of this V's. So I set out to really understand that. So how do we understand this role? Well, we have to do a response theory and it's actually not so difficult. Um, so you write down the equations of motions. They are second order differential equations. I put in some losses in here, some friction just to regularize the response, but it's like your imaginary parts of the energy. Only that I do this here to um, it's, it, it's really physically relevant, of course, there will be friction in the system. This is still the same dynamical matrix. And now I excite the system harmonically and I'm totally free to excite it anywhere where I like. So there is a vector Y and this tells me the different places, the different rotors that I wiggle. Um, I can wiggle them with different amplitudes and that's, I'm totally free to choose how I'm doing this then you're not surprised to see that the solution is just a Green's function. It's still a linear system at this case. So the, the response X, where how strong the system wiggles at a certain point, which rotor is moving the most, is mediated um, from the excitation via a Green's function, which you can write down very easily. And when you write it down, you see that there are, of course, some kind of basically Lorentzians uh, in there, complex Lorentzians, and then there are some matrices, U and the inverse of U. <clears throat> and how do they appear? 
well, in the previous plot here, I had to diagonalize, diagonalize M to get the eigenfrequencies. And um, for this, I have to, well, write M with these unitary matrices, where V is the inverse of U. Now, these so-called right eigenmodes, they are just the columns of U, and the left eigenmodes are the rows of V. And um, now here you see that I have the, basically the right eigenmodes here and the left eigenmodes over here. So they are really relevant for the response. If I want to see this without just showing you lots of examples, of course, I need some simple numbers. So I'm looking at the power spectrum. I just look at the long-term power either absorbed or emitted by the system. And I can resolve it, of course, by the point of excitation and um, where I pick up the signal. And then I can, for instance, sum over all the different excitation or signal points. And this is what I get uh, as, a, as an example. So I can have the situation where the two modes, the right mode and the left mode, are localized at the same part of the system. In frequency, I have the zero mode. It responds very strongly around the frequencies of the zero mode. But um, the sensitivity, depending on the point where I excite, is, uh, looks similar as an exponential profile to where the system replies and responds. But if I change this parameter, this non-reciprocity non parameter, epsilon it was called, and, and make um, the response, um, I can tilt response around. So now the system is still very sensitive uh, around um, this edge, but it replies very strongly at the other edge. Okay, so this, this already looks, uh, looks fine. So I see that my right eigenvectors tell me where the system responds, and, but the left eigenvectors tell me where it is the most sensitive. And that was really the open question at the time when I set out. But then, as, as always, if you start to do some research, then you find that there is something really interesting happening. So there is an interesting effect behind that. that there is a dynamical phase transition. <clears throat> and in order to see that, we have to go one step further. We have to characterize the whole system by one number. Um, and I know I'm, I'm, I just need this one or two minutes, Laszlo, and then I'm for keeping the time. So let's look at the total response of the system. If you do this, um, you have to sum over both uh, excitation and response point. You find basically Lorentzians, but multiplied by a number. And this number is a fascinating number. It's called the Peterman factor. It would be one in the Hermitian system. It would be not one in a normal gain-loss non-Hermitian system, but it becomes really interesting in these non-reciprocal systems. It's, it's generally a number larger than one, and it characterizes the enhanced noise because you have a non-Hermitian system. So it determines the overall sensitivity of the system. And um, if we um, look at uh, where, how this Peterman factor looked like in this particular system as a function of this non-reciprocity uh, parameters, we said that it becomes tremendously large in a certain range of um, non-reciprocity parameters. And this is exactly the same range in which the response and the, the, the sensitivity are, are, are on opposite sides of the system. So if I map this in parameter space, um, here I have the difference of couplings A and B, the dimerization. In this direction, I have epsilon. The white lines tell me this is the region in which I have these two different states uh, for response and reply. And inside, I have a very large Peterman factor. And it's actually going to diverge. So there is actually a mathematical or physical phase transition. And this is, of course, uh, related to directed amplification. So if you have an infinite system, you have directed amplification, you wiggle at the one side, your response will just exponentially increase and as a sum diverge in an infinitely large system. <clears throat> so this makes these systems wonderful sensors. And, um, and this is um, the additional observation of this talk. With this, I'm, I'm really done. I have prepared something else, but uh, you can ask questions about it. 
um, and I already knew that I will not get um, to this. There's a whole bunch of people that I need to thank, including Jasper, who gave this wonderful talk on this robotic um, beta materials a year ago on the conference where we meet in first, met in person in Stockholm, and then a whole lot of other people that I already mentioned in, in one way or the other. And this is my summary, so let's rather move on to the questions if there is still some time for that. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Henning, for the nice talk. So there is already one question by Pablo. So Pablo asks, first of all, he says hi. If uh, the directed response is exponential in X and the system is not dissipative, how is the energy conserved? Uh, the system is actually dissipative and it's actually an active system, so it's even worse. So, I mean, um, I think in terms of non-emission systems, in terms of the physics of them, there are two steps. And the first one is to put in losses because that usually doesn't bring in any further material dispersion effects. So it's very simple. Um, and this, the, the, the main thing is that it naturally preserves causality of your system. You have your resonances in the closed system on the real axis, just your energies, and then they move down and you just get finite lifetimes. This system, you actually make you have to pump in some ways. So these are active systems. In order to get this directed response, you need to measure the angle and then depending on the angle, induce a force. So okay. they are, um, and then, so you get actually, at some point, a pole would move up into the upper half of the complex plane and your response over time would start to increase exponentially. I see, I see. And, and, and therefore, you actually need to look at nonlinear physics, which I have done, but I don't have time to talk about now. But um, we can talk about this in private. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, there is one more question. I think, Henning, do you see the questions? Um, I don't know if I can do all so of these is, things are, at the same time. Yeah, so that is because a, I have the full screen here. Okay, so I I can read. Uh, there is a question from Shungun Park. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it possible to re revisit the or redefine bad boundary correspondence for non Hermitian systems? It is in many cases, but um, I'm not sure if there is a universal answer. So one way that I like to think about it is um, it's no longer enough to look at the symmetry classes. Uh, so that's, that's for sure. Um, so within the symmetry class, you need some additional topological numbers. And some people started to talk about um, bulk invariance and boundary invariance. And, and, and the thing is, which is maybe you can think is a bit disappointing, but some of the invariants depend on the details of your interface. That was, of course, the thing which we loved about the normal topological systems, that you didn't need that. You only needed to have bulk invariance. There's still invariance that you can calculate, including the, co the configuration of your interface. And it's been shown mostly in examples, I would say, even though some of these will probably easily transfer. But um, so you can calculate these um, boundary invariance and they will, so they're wave function based, parameters based uh, calculations which will tell you something about the spectrum. So they're still useful, but they're a little bit more mathematical and they're not useful in the same way as you can take your, you build your condensed master system in a certain symmetry class and then you know that there will be the, the, the effect. But at, at least what we know by looking at the table, I, I think is um, we know that defect states can appear we can, because we can say, the boundary invariance might take certain values. We just don't know which value it will take by just looking at the symmetry class. Thank you, Henning. There is one more question, so I'm going to ask. We are still slightly over time, but I think mm -hmm. since you are an invited speaker, we can ask one more question. Can I ask? We, we started one minute late. Yeah, yes. So I think uh, we can still ask this question. Since the SSH model belongs to uh, the BDI topological class with a Z topological invariant, if you had longer range hoppings for the neighbors, could you find similar results, but with more uh, eigenstates? Or it's, it's Absolutely. Yes. So you, you, 
so far I looked at the single one, which has only basically it's almost like that too, and everything is beautifully explained. There's a question in in, in your short course in the short course of Nazi and Co. I think uh, which for which you basically gave away the answer. So we have only only this single state here, but if you wanted to have more states um, on. on on this this axis, one way to do it is to introduce uh, longer range hoppings, and of course, it just becomes much more complicated. So, um, because as I mentioned, um, the spectral degeneracies can appear in more subtle ways. So you can get spectral degeneracies everywhere uh, between any pairs of, of states. Um, and I'm working out on a different answer, but I cannot tell you the answer yet. That, um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Henning, again. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, everyone is very welcome to speak around, and of course, that is going to be the afternoon session. Yes. And if Henning, you are joining us there, then this also... this afternoon I can join. Yesterday, unfortunately, I could not. Okay. Uh, so I think we can move on now to the. I, I stop sharing my screen. Yes. So thanks for thank the questions. You. Thank you, Henning, again. So uh, next speaker is. Uh, Sarah Sayad, uh, and she is going to talk about the dynamics of non hermitian Kitayev chains. So, okay, welcome, you. Sarah. So, you have uh, 20 minutes total, and I'm going to raise my hand in uh, uh, when you have only five minutes left. Okay, okay. good. Thank you. So, today I would like to present some of our results on dynamics of non hermitian Oh. Okay, dynamics of non hermitian key type chain. First of all, at the first part of my talk, I will present some uh, brief uh, explanation about the key type chain. Then I will move on to interacting system and I will tell you how we can interpret it in terms of non hermitian system. And at the end, I will devote the rest of the talk to describing some of the uh, time evolution of this particular interacting system. This work has been done in collaboration with Adolfo Borussian, Jane Longyu, and Lucas Cyber. The Hamiltonian of the 1D superconducting wire comprises three terms, a hopping term where electrons are allowed to hop from one side of the lattice to the next nearest side with a hopping amplitude of J, a superconducting term with the ampl appearing amplitude of delta, and that the on-site energy is adjusted by the chemical potential mu. For throughout the whole presentation, I will set delta to be equal to J. Using a uh, time translation, um, translational symmetry of the system, we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian in the K space and then write down the bulk spectrum. This bulk spectrum consists of two bands, a positive and negative. We can draw this uh, spectrum as a function of momentum for varying values of the chemical potential. What we are witnessing is that the gapless uh, gap phase is uh, at mu equals to two and minus two, exp experiencing some closure. And that's what's happening in the spectrum of this system. To get more intuition of what exactly is going on, we can re-express this Hamiltonian in terms of myon of fermions. And then we, have, we are witnessing two distinct topological phases. One is topologically trivial phase, at which we are uh, seeing that the locally pairing between myronos is taking place in the system. This occurs for chemical potentials larger than 2J and less than minus 2J. Between this range of uh, minus 2J and 2J of chemical potential, the, exp the system undergoes some pairing between nearest neighbors of myron um, fermions, leaving out two unpaired uh, edge modes. And these edge modes are associated with the energy of zero. So basically, that's why we are referring to that as unpaired myron zero modes. So basically, that's all we need to know about the uh, Kitaev chain in the Hermitian case. Now, let me move on and tell you what particular interacting system that I'm interested in and how we can explain it in terms of non-Hermitian systems. Uh, in the first presentation, we heard about the, uh, you know, system with loss and gains, and I exactly would like to move on my presentation based on that line. What I'm uh, in particular interested in, we want to couple our Kitaev chain to some type of local reservoir particle in such a way that uh, electrons with the rate of uh, GL, gamma L, and gamma G are allowed to exchange particle with the system. Since this system as low, uh, you know, this particle, this uh, 
open quantum system can be described by Limblodia master equation for the uh, time evolution of density matrix. And what you're seeing in the equation, we, we have some type of non-dissipative term, which is coming from a unitary evolution of the density matrix. And we have another term which incorporates the interaction between the environment and the bus. Since our L, which is a jump operator, is linear, we can construct a bus matrix in such a way that is quadratic. Thanks to the super operator for malism, we can write, uh, rewrite the the Williams, basically this operator, in terms of a block triangular uh, form for all the systems which both the Hamiltonian and the bass matrix is quadratic using two types of uh, matrices like X and Y. Y, y matrix completely convey the information of bass. Uh, the X matrix combines and incorporates the information of the bass and the and our system. When we're looking precisely on the structure of Y and X matrix, we'll notice that by construction, Y matrix is Hermitian and is proportional to differences between the rate of loss and gain. The X matrix is a combination of the anti-Hermitian and the Hermitian matrix. So basically, we can interpret that as some version of non-Hermitian key type model. Thanks to the uh, dissipation nature of the whole system, basically by construction, we know that the, this spectrum, which is complex, should always have a negative imaginary part because it should decay in time. Moreover, for the case of BLS loss and gain, where gamma G equals to gamma L, we've noticed that Y is completely zero because of its, how it's constructed. And when we are looking at, at the eigenvalues X matrix, we'll notice that these eigenvalues are complex. Here, I will try to illustrate this uh, band structure using uh, two different lines. So for instance, we, for solid lines that you see in this figure is related to a real part of the um, this eigenvalue and the dashed line uh, stands for the imaginary part. What I would like to present in these three panels is that first panel is for uncoupled system, which is exactly like the um, Hermitian Kitaev model. Then we have a moderate coupling between the bass and system with gamma equals to 0.5. And also I will present something related to strong coupling regime. So let's have a look. We first have a, a, you know, real line gap system. There is also a gapless feature and uh, you will notice that how the imaginary part evolves. Not only if you look at uh, gapless phase, if you look at the band structure, we will notice that there are some cases where real part is zero while imaginary part is gapped. So basically we've recognized three distinct gaps, uh, real line and uh, complex gaps in the system. Let me be more, me, let me be more precise and I'll show you the phase diagram. So if I draw the phase diagram as the function of gamma as a coupling to the bass and uh, chemical potential, at gamma equals zero, we are having the, uh, the phase diagram of the key type model with a real line gap with a trivial phase and topological phase. In the topological phase, this phase still survives for a finite and larger value of gamma. We were observing that for this value, for this system, the edge modes are present, but while the real part is zero, the imagined part of one of them is zero and the other one possesses a value of a minus i for gamma. For the bulk spectrum of both a real part of uh, this topological phase and the trivial phase, the bulk spectrum has a, a negative value, the imagined part of minus two gamma. This being said, we also intriguingly you can notice that for any phases which reside in the window of minus two to two of chemical potential, we can observe two phases of, with imaginary light gap and gap phase of uh, gapless phase, which both of them has edge modes. This edge mode has been presented like a diamond lines in these two figures. This exactly these two lines. Moreover, outside this window, we have two phases. We talked already about the real line gap, which is trivial. We also have a gapless phase, which is trivial, which witnessing no um, edge modes in the system. This being said, we already have some uh, understanding about the phase diagram. And now uh, I think it is time to move on to tell you how exactly I want to explore the dynamics of the system and how much of the dynamics can figure out and tell you more information about this phase diagram. Being more precise, I would like to pre uh, prepare my system in the ground state of a system with gamma zero and exactly with this particular value of chemical potential. And then I suddenly uh, want to change the value of uh, gamma and chemical potential to some finite value inside the phase diagram. 
Using this protocol, I would like to track the information and dynamics of a particular observable. This is a two, uh, coming from a two-point correlation function known as covariance matrix. I will solve this covariance matrix in time using the Limbaladia master equation and this equation motion. You will notice that it is uh, connected to the matrix of X and Y. And then I will by partitioning over half of the chain and using this uh, reduced covariance matrix, I can calculate these eigenvalues and we will refer to that from now on as single particle entanglement spectrum. What we are exactly want to observe in a few minutes is we want to see that how the dynamics of this entanglement spectrum works in time and whether we can grasp some information regarding the topology in this system. Now let's try to see, show how this works. So basically what I want to do is I want to show you that for the case of the imaginary line gap as a post coinage Hamiltonian of the final system, we'll notice that since the whole spectrum of this phase is imaginary, what's happening is that when we are looking at the phase diagram as the entanglement spectrum as a function of time is purely decaying and is exponentially relaxing in time. Since the value of coupling is large, so basically the system is very dissipated, this relaxation is quite fast and it just relaxed very quickly. Now we can move on to the uh, gapless phase with a uh, in the gapless phase, we not only observe relaxation in time as an exponential decaying, but also there are some oscillation is evident in the system. These oscillations also are present, but there are no features of crossing is can be observed in the system. If you look at the real line gap, you're witnessing that basically the phase diagram of real line gap has the bulk spectrum, which has the imaginary part of two gamma. So basically I can multiply the whole, the whole uh, a spectrum by the factor of e to the four gamma t, which is dominant a decay factor of this system. By doing so, we are observing that the whole uh, rest of the spectrum is pretty much accumulating at the values of minus one, one, minus one and one, and no very interesting feature and you know dynamics is taking place in this system. But now we will be very much intrigued when we are looking at the topological phase, because in this phase, we not only can detect the relaxation dynamics in the system, but also we are seeing that there are two pairs of uh, modes, basically two pairs of modes, which numerously undergo uh, crossing points, basically these points. And then interestingly, we are observing that if you try to write a uh, draw, also, the fat end of the reduced matrix as a black line in this figure, you'll notice that at the same time that the crossing is taking place, the fat end is also changing sign. And also this shaded line is representing the sign of the fat end. So basically, this spectrum is also giving me some information about that what is underlying physics, uh, which is to some extent the topological features in this system, and this feature is only present inside the topological phase of the of this uh, spectrum. We can further on investigate about how, what is the nature of uh, this particular point and how it varies as, as we are approaching to the phase boundary. To do so, what I will try to do is that I will first present that at this point, uh, I, can, I, I will take out this time and then try to plot it as a function of delta mu and delta gamma. These two factors are defined in this manner, basically, is showing you how much we are approaching to the phase boundary from different direction to these lines where the real line gap is trying to trans, um, make a phase transition to the gapless phase. In this case, we are noticing that as we are approaching to the large to the phase boundary, the time at which first crossing is taking place is going to diverge and become larger. This divergence is associated with the exp uh, critical exponent of one half and that is exactly what we're also observing that there's some type of critical dynamics is also uh, is the underlying um, physics of this system. This being said, I think um, I'm pretty much at the end. I'm ready to wrap up my talk. So I present you the phase diagram of the uh, dissipative key chain. I told you that there are three different uh, line gaps can be observed in this system. And for all the phases which are residing between the value of minus two and two uh, chemical potential, we can detect edge modes in the system. We further on uh, discuss that for the cases of when you're elaborating and discussing on the time evolution of the system, the dynamics inside the topological phase for the post-coach Hamiltonian uh, uh, show some type of a 
crossings. And this crossing can be also understood from the fact when we are tracking the Fafians and is also interpreted some related to some versions of the critical dynamics in the system. This being said, I think uh, this is done. The only point that I would like to emphasize is that it's just the tip of the iceberg. We can uh, elaborate this um, type of formalism using a dynamics as well as the realm of the non-Hermitian physics in order to understand lots of other interacting systems. And that's very much we're intrigued to do so in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, so if there are some questions, then from the audience, then please uh, either write uh, your question in the chat, or you can also raise your hand and then we can let you ask the question. Uh, if there are, so if you have people type their uh, questions, then I have just a single question regarding uh, the systems. So you basically, if I understood correctly, you just uh, looked for a system of a single Kitaev chain with two edges. True. Um, and uh, you know one of the applications of, of the Hita of, of, of Majorana, so the edge modes of the Hita chains would be to, uh, to use them in braiding experiments. And I was wondering whether so those uh, those states which survive uh, as edge states, whether they could be used also in braiding experiments, and uh, uh, and what are the pecu peculiarities uh, arising in uh, in these systems. Well, what is interesting about our system is that our, so basically in the conventional key type model, the edge moves are, is not dissipated, but this particular edge moves are dissipated. So basically this particular one has a four gamma and this dissipation of this system will allow us to manipulate the edge modes and the way that they're surviving in the system. Because uh, basically by manipulating this coupling to the past, you can also, uh, control the relaxation dynamics of this system and basically it also provided some other dimension basically the dimension of time to control the the lifetime of the myron animals the way that they're surviving or they're going to be killed so this is another way to control the system basically thank you uh if there are there any more questions from the audience well Maybe I, I can add something. We studied at a very similar system in a, it wasn't the Kitai chain. It, it is actually the full, this Luchin models for nanowires with the spin orbit coupling and Majoranas. And when you couple this to a reservoir, you also have all these exceptional point bifurcations and so on. And related to Laszlo's question, indeed you can, you can prove uh, braiding properties of this kind of uh, dissipative modes, zero mo Majorana zero modes in this in these kind of systems so the answer to Laszlo's question is, is yes you, you can you can do all these kind of things okay thank you uh, I, I missed the paper uh, and there is also one more question from Alberto I think Alberto you can also ask the question yourself if you are here uh, sorry uh, could you comment on a little bit of the symmetry your model your dissipative model uh, processes is there a conjugation map uh, symmetry as well as far as this is related to the Ramon, Ramon and Pablo and Elsa's uh, work. Well, uh, yes. sure. Move on. So basically our system has um, is in the AZ dagger class of the topological system and has a BDI dagger class. In this BDI dagger class, we have a time reversal dagger, uh, which basically in the first part of the talk, we heard about the time reversal symmetry, which is not exactly the time reversal symmetry in Hermitian system is because of the dissection with the uh, transpose matrix and conjugates of that. And then we have a chiral symmetry and the particle hole dagger symmetry in the system. And is associated with the invariance of a Z2 uh, topological invariance can be detected. And this Z2 topological invariant is also only present in the real line gaps with topological and, uh, and the trivial phase. And the rest is completely cannot be described by anything, which is, which is because of the fact that uh, the both boundary correspondence completely broken. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks again for the nice talk and uh, for keeping up the time. Uh, I think we can move on to the next speaker. So Esteban Rodriguez, uh, if uh, okay. Esteban, you can share your screen. Give me a sec.
So Astam is going to talk about harnessing light to control spin charge and valley currents in two-dimensional topological honeycomb materials. And, uh, yeah. I need a little bit more of time. I'm facing some. Okay. Uh, can you see the, yes. the, the yeah, presentation now? Yeah. Okay. So okay. Your 20 minutes start now. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Esteban Rodriguez. I'm a physics PhD student at, at the Universidad de Chile in Santiago, Chile. On behalf of my collaborators and I, we would like to thank the organizer for giving us the chance to present our work. So, uh, what is the deal with the work today? Uh, I, I think you are all, all familiar with the standard band structure of a, of a ribbon of a topological insulator. And in, uh, in contrast to most of the, of the 12 we have watched, today we are going to offer a new, a new use of topological states. We are not looking for to induce topological behavior. We will try to use a material which is native topologically. And we will use light and some facts that are valid in, in honeycomb lattices in order to shatter selectively one of these uh, edge state. So we will go from this uh, picture to the picture at the, at the bottom. So we will shatter one of them. And this is, uh, I coined the, personally coined the term that we will use as a um, light as a topological lever in the sense that you can switch whatever the current you want from a spin up or a spin down or some sort of char polarized uh, uh, current. Uh, and that's, that's most of the talk in a nutshell. So what's the plan of the talk? We will try to describe a little bit of the ingredients that are many in this talk. Uh, some some floquet, uh, some flocket features that we will use since we will use light uh, in a temporary potential and some of the consequences in a char in a transport setup in a, in a honeycomb material which is natively topological. So this is another cool tale about honeycomb lattices. Perhaps some of you are quite tired of this because it's, this is quite trendy in the last years. So there's, this is a very broad family with special features in other you for to get this grasp in a nutshell, we have uh, the graphene or we have some heavy materials that induce uh, uh, intrinsic spin orbit coupling or rush terms. For, for instance, we have a distanin, which is a bit, uh, quantum spin hole effect. And also this has analogs in photonic uh, lattices too, where you can mimic completely all the topological behavior in this uh, these honeycomb materials. Uh, I strongly recommend you to visit this Rengsman's paper about the using not only condensed matter setup but also this uh, flow kit uh, systems. So today we were going to use the the well-known Kane-Mel model. Just I will describe in a few words what is this. We will use the Kane-Mel model in the flavor that we will use two copies of the Haldane model. The Haldane model is basically the honeycomb lattice when we, we, ha we will add the second nearest neighbor complex uh, hoppings. And this, so the complete Hamiltonian that we will be using will be one copy that represents uh, the spin up and the spin down, and each of one will be a, a Haldane model. So you have the first neighbor hoppings with the hopping amplitude uh, J. We will have the second nearest complex neighbor hoppings, which controls the topological phases through this parameter phi. And also we will see this is quite important that we will need the semen of mass term. We will neglect uh, uh, any rush of term just to make it simply the numerical implementation of the device that we will use. Another uh, special feature that we will need is the circular decrease in honeycomb lattices. Uh, Rui Chido Saito and collaborators found that if, when you shine uh, with, uh, 
with light, uh, honeycomb lattices, you can find whether you have a, a optical transition element from the balance band to the conduction band, and it, it can distinguish if you have if if you are in a topological phase or not. In the case of linear polar uh, in the circular polarized light, if you are in topo in, in the trivial phase, you have all the uh, transition elements from the balance band to the conduction band. They don't distinguish in any kind of the ballets. But in in the case when you turn out to to be using circular, uh, I'm sorry, when you are in the topological non-trivial regime the handlings of the polarization of the light will be quite important, showing a strong coupling with the, uh, with the light in, in the external electromagnetic field, or you will see that there is not, no coupling whatsoever. Okay, so now we will move to the Floquet topological quantum phases. As a first precedent, I will, um, I will tell you uh, in, in a nutshell the story that quite several years ago, there was proposals to induce topology, topology in demand on graphene using light in the, um, in the circular polarized, polarized uh, light. So they induce topological behavior. And there are another proposals to induce topological behavior as well as the, the really nice talk by Sultan Tykov yesterday by mechanical strain. But in this case, we are going in an opposite direction, as I mentioned in the, in the first slides. We are not trying to induce any topological behavior. We are trying to shatter it. So this is the picture that it's not what we're going to do. Floquet flavors, uh, of, uh, there are many floquet flavors or whatever you work you want. You can think of your own work that you're doing today. And there's probably a floquet flavor that it is really re recent. And this is recent area that's moving now towards non emission systems also. There are many uh, experimental observations which, which are quite new, ranging from uh, acoustic setups, ultra cold atoms, photonic lattices. And also one that's particularly interesting for me is the light induced anomalous hole effect in graphene, which proves to, uh, to show in a transport set of what, what is the, this light-induced topological behavior in graphene. Uh, if, if you had the chance to attend the, to James McIver's excellent talk in this uh, topic, uh, I strongly recommend you to vis revisit it. It was in the Monday session. So let's try to uh, get a sense of what the Floquet theory is. Uh, I, I, I think I, I don't have to explain to any of you what, uh, what is the Bloch theorem. It's the well known from our solid state physics. Then that the Floquet theory is more or less the same where you can find a complete agent state basis uh, made of a phase which involves a quasi-energy quasi and uh, a, a function that is time periodic with the, the period the same as the, the, the time periodic potential that you're using in your system. So this is uh, known as the Floquet theorem. And the fact is that if you have the Hamiltonian, which is time periodic, and also the Floquet uh, states are also time periodic, you can use per the, this periodicity to use a Fourier expansion. What does that mean? That if you have a system which is originally 2D, 2D especially 2D, and with one time, direction. Now you can map this uh, time direction to a synthetic third dimension in space, and you can settle on a, um, on a Hamiltonian, which involves all, all the harmonics of this periodic uh, uh, potential that you, you are using. In our case, that will be light. This uh, formalism turns to be exact, a, a variational uh, criteria where you can use many of the the copies of your system in this synthetic dimension. And you can see whatever the observable you want to check if this, uh, this has already converged. And if, you, if your signal that you're evaluating it's not converged, you can just use more replicas. So this is known as the Floquet Hamiltonian. So we now map uh, uh, all the, the time direction in a static direction and we have uh, this uh, agent balloon problem to solve. So in order for you to better grasp the, the idea, if you have um, a zigzag honeycomb, uh, let us say a zigzag uh, graphene lattice, 
if you have a, a very high frequencies, you are approaching to this, uh, the, static, uh, the static case where any of the copies behave in an independent way. But as long as you are approximating to the low frequencies, the band structures of these copies start to hybridize, inducing new physics. So in order for you to understand this in, uh, in a band structure, I depict here the six graphene under linear polarized light with five replicas. And this is the time uh, average density of states. So uh, you can check by hand that this time average density of state is the, way, the weight of the Wayne functions over the replica zero. And in contrast with the, with the normal zigzag uh, uh, honeycomb ribbon, you see that the hybridization of this phantom that is uh, in the back, if you don't see the phantom, I will use this new uh, color scheme, it starts to hybridize with the whole the bands and using new physics and eventually creating new gaps. Over here, there's no new gap because this is a linear polarized light, which does not break any time reversal symmetry. But uh, this hybridization will turn to be the key to, uh, to see the mechanism we were about to witness. So using the light as a topological lever, now we will see how we can do this. Specifically, we will, let, uh, we will let the light in. We will have uh, time the vector periodic potential of the light with phi, the, the parameter that controls the light polarization for phi, capital phi equals to zero. We have linear polarization for capital phi equals P over two will be circular. And this will be perpendicular to the sample, which is the ribbon. And now the, each of the copies of the Haldane model, we will have the, uh, uh, the hopping amplitude renormalized using the prior substitution. And since the, this uh, vector potential is periodic and as well as the Hamiltonian is periodic and we will use the Floquet theorem, we can start to make this uh, uh, Floquet replicas scheme. So now we turn into the one of the key plots of the talk, which is uh, the, the van structures. And what we can see is that if we settle on one Fermi energy over the gap, for example, in the figure A, if you pick the Fermi energy over here, you will find that most of the transport should be in a transport setup uh, attenuated in this area. But the only kind of channel that will be active will be this one. In the case of the uh, spin down, you can see that in this, uh, for this Fermi energy, both of lines of the transport will be allowed, which is the signal of the circular decreasing that we, we talked in the few first slides. Linear polarization does not exhibit the circular pol uh, this circular decreasing. So if you pick any Fermi energy within this region, you will have a one-way transport. But remember that uh, one pair of these will uh, make the complete whole system because we are considering one of each copies of the Haldane model to be one k mele model stacking. Okay, so in order to check what are the consequences of this in a transport setup, we will use the following. Uh, the following. So this is a picture a schematically of our type banding model. We will have a laser spot that we will be shined in the center of the ribbon, and the laser spot we will decay towards the lead. So in order for us to to guarantee the, the occupations to be uh, well defined in the, in, the, in the source and the drain. And in the Floquet context, we have to make a, a little bit of a modification to, to the land that we're traditional formalism is that we have the transmission coefficients. We have to define a replica of incidence and the complete transmission from the left to the right will be defined as the sum of the partial, um, the partial transmission coefficients from left to the right. So what we see is that the transmission coefficients displays a sharp region defined of one-way transport. And a happy consequence of the Floquet theory, the Floquet theory in the transport setups, well, usually this is not regarded as a, a, Floquet, a happy consequence because in Floquet, you have these components which are known as pumping currents. Pumping currents are, have been regarded as a spurious component because you, don't, you cannot define voltimeter conditions, for, ex, for instance, in multi-terminal setups, but in press the, the, 
the bias to the zero bias regime, we can study the pumping currents. And since we are, we are having this sharp contrast one-way region, we can compute this, which uh, depends on transmission coefficients through the difference. And we can find that in the time reversal broken for circular polarization, a spin polarized charge current flux flows. On the other hand, when the time reversal is preserved for linear polarization, pure spin current flows. So this is quite nice because if you have as any transport setup and you want to develop a spin polarized current, you can use this honeycomb lattice using the light in order to create this, uh, this pump current in the zero bias regime with a uh, polarization over the, if I'm correct, 83%. And in the linear case, uh, you can have a spin, a pure spin current. Okay, in this case of the spin down, both wires are, are allowed with the uh, right hand uh, for circular decreasing. And in order just to fix ideas, and uh, I think I, I have no, no more time, we can pick the linear, uh, linear polarization at uh, E equals 0 0.1. And if, if you set it here in 0 0.1, you can see that you can kill this state and kill this other. And when one edge, you will find that you have a just pure spin current. So in order to check if this, uh, this uh, light induced uh, photon rest processes are the responsible of this, uh, this blockade of the transport of the, this state, we can study the detailed transport uh, over all the replicas, and we can find the complete relation over the reflection coefficients through the coupling to the higher order replicas. So this shows that indeed the photon dressed processes induced by the light are the responsible of the blockade of this state, just preserving the transmission coefficients for the states that don't, do not hybridize with light. Okay, in the case of linear polarization, we find that this is follows a, a exactly mirror uh, a scheme because you don't have any kind of uh, circular decreasing in the in this case. So the conclusions of this talk is that we can generate current using light in zero bias regime and you can control which kind of current you want and even if you can control the hands of your polarization you can select which spin you want to transport in a pure spin polarized charge current and the pure spin currents or, or pure charge spin polarized current can be gener gener generated. So the main ingredients are the coupling with the uh, electron photon states inducing by light and using the decrease. And also the, this consequence, the photocurrents that only appears in the flocket context. So this is my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Esteban. I think Alberto has a question. So. Uh... Hi, uh, thank you, thank you for, for this talk. So I have a question. So uh, I was told uh, that uh, in real experiments, when they use this photogalvanic phenomena, mm -hmm. uh, light also hits the sample. Yes, that's and true. And hits the sample locally. So it, and also, uh, do you expect any deviation from from this local heating uh, uh, in your theory? Because I mean, uh, there is also this heat transfer that can modify from how the the, the distribution function you are using, right? Um, to be honest, I, I, I do not know how serious are these, uh, are these heating problems in, in real experiment setups. Uh, if I remember correctly, there are some tricks that you can do in order to avoid this using like these pulsated lasers. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not quite sure which is, which is the detail of, of this. James McIver gave an, exp gave an explanation, but uh, um, experimental setups for this are really new, so I can kind of not my expertise. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, that's fine. No, I, I'm, I'm not aware, I'm not familiar with this, so I'm always, I'm always uh, uh, afraid about this, this, this kind of spurious effect that you are not considering. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's a, there's a known thing that m m this laser intensity also can blow up the the whole sample. But uh, 
there was a there there is an experimental observation of this in back in 2019 so this is really new and they yeah. develop a really new technique by their own so I, 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 i'm not quite sure how does it work okay i'm gonna check the, this experiment so it's, it's quite they seem quite interesting thank you okay Okay, thank you again, Esteban. Uh, I think uh, we can move on to the next speaker. Okay. The next speaker is, uh, so please don't share your screen. And the next speaker is Daniel Munoz Segovia, uh, and who is going to talk about many body effects in nodal line semimetals, correction to the optical conductivity. So please, uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, yes, I'm. Okay. Yeah, okay. Share screen. Should... Okay, and can you make it full screen? Yeah. Okay. To be working now. Yeah. Can you see it correctly? Yes. Okay, so, perfect. So, hello everybody. And um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to give a talk here at the FFS conference. Uh, today I will present our work in which we have studied some many body effects in other lines in metals. In particular, we have computed the the interaction correction due to the long range electron electron interactions to the optical conductivity. And all the details can be found in this paper. This work was done uh, with Alberto Cortijo, and I really want to thank him for all his guidance and support during the, during the project. So, another line in metal is a topological semi metal where the balance and the conduction band cross along one dimensional lines in the Brillouin zone. These lines might have very different shapes. They can be open lines, they can be closed loops, they can form chains of loops, etc. Our model is based on um, the low energy band structure of calcium 3 d phosphide, which displays a Dirac nodal ring of radius k0 in the kx ky plane at kc equals 0. And uh, contrary to what happens in general in other uh, nodal lines in metals, this nodal line is located at constant energy, and indeed it is located at the Fermi energy. Um, and this, this line is uh, protected by the combination of spin rotation symmetry plus uh, either um, the product time reversal times inversion or, uh, or a reflection, a mirror about the, the, C, the, the XY plane. We further uh, make a linear approximation around the node uh, and we get this uh, linear Hamiltonian where the B are the Fermi velocities and the tau are the Pauli matrices representing an orbital degree of freedom. So this is uh, a Dirac nodal line, this uh, spin de degenerate. And the K are the, the momenta but measured in toroidal coordinates, which are basically cylindrical coordinates but with origin at each point of the, of the nodal line. Uh, for simplicity, we also assume uh, isotropic Fermi velocity. And I want to highlight that uh, this linear Hamiltonian is equivalent to remaining at uh, leading order in an expansion over uh, the inverse of the radius of the nodal line. So we are working in this large K0 limit. And in this uh, limit, there is uh, effectively no, no dispersion along the angular direction, along the direction of, of the line node in our case. So the, uh, the dispersion is effectively two-dimensional uh, and indeed with these approximations um, uh, we can regard each point of the, uh, of the line node as a two-dimensional uh, Dirac massless uh, dispersion uh, along the radial and the C directions. And therefore, uh, after working a bit, we can express basically the, the, the nodal line semimetal conductivity as the integral over the, the, the line node of the conductivity in graphene uh, times some projection factors. And, and the main point of our work will be to, to exploit this, this analogy to, 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 uh, to make the calculations. So the motivation for our work is the, the, the expected effect uh, of the long range electron-electron uh, interactions on the, uh, on some, on the topological semimetals. And it is known that in point node semimetals, both in uh, 2D and 3D, uh, if the nodes are located at the Fermi energy, then uh, due to the vanishing density of states, uh, there is weak screening 
and therefore the Coulomb interaction remains long range and only marginally irrelevant in the RG, uh, in the renormalization group point of view. And uh, some observables have been shown uh, then to Daniel, are you here? I think you broke up. Hello? Daniel, are you around? Uh, it seems that we have lost you. Alberto, can you uh, ping Daniel? Alberto, can you? Uh, uh, what happened? Uh, we lost Daniel. Oh, uh, probably he is not, is not connected, right? It seems. Can you try to uh, find him? Uh, can, you can, can you invite him? But he's not, uh, I think he's not. Um, he's not online? He's not online, no. I... Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm writing to him, uh, uh, what's up? Mm -hmm. So sorry for this inconvenience. Uh, we apologize to the to the audience. So we are we hope we recover Danny uh, yeah. as soon as possible. So I'm waiting to for, for any response. Well, in any case, uh, um, in the in the case that uh, uh, we cannot recover Danny, uh, I gotta encourage him to to be uh, to the in the afternoon session, session just yeah. uh, to make a short summary yeah. and allow him to make a short summary, just in case uh, you yes. wanna ask him. Yes. So the question is now. Uh... Okay. The, the the idea is just to wait till the next speaker because uh, we we. Want to keep the, the schedule? The schedule. So um, now it's almost eleven. So at eleven, uh, ten. eleven ten. So Joao can switch. So I gonna if if Danny connects, uh, I gonna talk to him and I gonna ask him. Uh, yes, I think uh, are... about the possibility of keeping some uh, the part of the talk uh, in the afternoon. So let's wait for I know. Uh, just 10 minutes, so, ah, so, so Danny, Danny, Danny is Danny. back, Danny is back, so... Danny, can, can you connect, um, you can, you, you still have uh, ten five minutes. minutes. Yeah, five minutes from the talk. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay, so that, please Danny share yeah, your screen. He's writing that uh, he's connecting. Okay. Okay, I'm making him co-host. So, Danny, you can now. Uh, you, are, you, are, you have the, the permissions to, to switch uh, to, okay. to the screen. Uh, sorry, uh, I've moved moved this week uh, to another home, and internet has gone. Sorry, I'm now with the mobile phone. Uh, so, um, 
five minutes, no? Yes. Uh, uh, perfect. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, I, I was saying that. Uh, so uh, sorry. Uh, I was uh, saying that uh, it is interesting to uh, uh, comment on the analogous problem of the con correction to the optical conductivity in graphene, since uh, there there was a, a long-standing controversy over the value of the interaction coefficient c that you get via perturbation theory. But now uh, there seems to be agreement, and if, if one ensures that gauge invariant holds and properly subtract the counter terms that diverge in perturbation theory, gets the, the result first obtained by Mishenko, which is uh, supported in our work because we have, uh, because of this analogy between analyzing and metals and graphene. So, uh, well, we have worked in the collisionless regime at zero temperature and zero chemical potential. And, uh, well, this is the, the non-interacting conductivity of the nodal lines in metal, which is basically the same as in graphene, but with a factor of the radius of the nodal line, since we are basically a, 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 a large n graphene with n being k naught, the radius of the, the, well, the perimeter of the nodal line. This was already known, and in, uh, for the interaction correction, uh, we have obtained uh, this result that is, uh, well, has the same anisotropy as, uh, as the non-interacting case, and this is simply because the nodal line is in the xy plane. And we have got uh, the same uh, result for the numerical coefficient c, uh, which is universal also, like as in graphene. And, uh, well, uh, the main effect introduced by the interactions is, um, to introduce a, a frequency dependence, remember that, sorry, I, 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 I forgot to, to mention. In the non-interacting case, the, the conductivity of the nodal lines in metal is frequency independent, but when you introduce the interactions to first order in perturbation theory, then you get a, a, a correction that uh, in the, in the um, asymptotic limit where the frequency is much smaller than the cutoff, uh, sub lambda, um, uh, scales that way, so the conductivity increases uh, logarithmically with the, with the frequency. And this behavior is fundamentally different from what happens in bile semimetals, since uh, in bile semimetals, in this asymptotic limit, the interaction correction is asymptotically constant. So in bile semimetals, the, in the non-interacting limit, the optical conductivity depends linearly on the frequency, but the interaction correction on top of that is constant. And this has been associated to a uh, violation of the uh, hyperscaling in three plus one dimensional critical points. But however, since nodal lines in metals also live in three plus one D, uh, then this is not the only reason. And we believe that uh, it is, it has to do also with the renormalization of the charge in bile semimetals, which does not happen in nodal lines in metals. So with that, I conclude that we have uh, um, uh, seeing that the optical conductivity, contrary to what happens in isotropic Fermi liquids, gets interaction corrections, and we have computed that to first order in perturbation theory, and we have seen the close uh, that there is a close parallelism also in the interacting in the interaction correction between uh, graphene and and, and nodal lines in metals, uh, but we have seen also the, that there is a, a fundamental difference between uh, nodal lines in metals and bi semi metals. And um, well, uh, some experiments, uh, let me comment that some experiments have measured the optical conductivity in nodal lines in metals, but however, this, the materials where it, where it has been measured have more complex features that are not captured in our, in our model. So our uh, correction, which is small, is, is hidden in the experiments. Uh, but well, it would be interesting to analyze some, some of these, these effects. Uh, for example, disorder would be interesting to analyze the interplays between disorder and interaction. So sorry for, for the problems and thank you very much for your attention. That's all. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you, so thank you very much, uh, Danny. And, uh, uh, actually, you were perfect in time. So is there any question in the audience?
I, I, I'm really sorry. I, I, I mean, no, don't I, worry. That, that's fine. I, so I never I encourage... had problems these days, and just today at this hour, it, it, it had to it had to, to happen. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a good event. So uh, let me let me remind the the, the, the attendants that uh, and let me encourage you to be this afternoon in the afternoon session because uh, we actually have a lot of time. So perhaps there are more questions uh, after uh, in this in this session. So. I have a question that you can comment on at the end, and it's something that we already discussed. So there are some experiments in some materials that in absence of, of a spin orbit coupling, uh, they are considered as a normal isomer metal, but when you include a spin orbit coupling, they become gap, right? But they are strongly uh, doped. Can you comment on the effect of doping or uh, if, how those results could extend to, to those materials? And uh, uh uh, I believe that when you have a, a finite chemical potential, uh, then um, you you have a, a finite uh, density of state, so you will have a screen interaction, and um, therefore the, the the long range interaction would effectively become short range. And indeed, uh, while preparing the presentation, I've been thinking about uh, the validity of RPA in our system and. Uh, in our model, and I believe that RPA is indeed valid for the, the, the range of parameters where our model is valid. So in principle, I, I would say that if the, the experiments uh, fit, to, uh, is, are well described by our model, uh, then we would simply apply RPA and recover a Fermi liquid like behavior in some sense. So no effect, no, no interaction correction. This is what, what I expect, but we can talk later if you want. Okay. okay, okay. So uh, we have still some yeah. minutes. So I was also interested to uh, ask uh, mm -hmm. how uh, the surface states can uh, influence these results. So well, you have... This is course. a good question, but we have not uh, studied this yet. Um, but yes, I, this would depend on the... On the um, on the material, since uh, the, the surface states are not, in non aligned semi-metals are not so universal. I mean, depend on the surface, on the, the, the in general, they are famous for having uh, almost flat uh, drum head surface states, but these are uh, not, not generally protective, let's say. So we should, uh, but it, it's an interesting question, yeah. I don't know. Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, is there any more questions? So we have, in principle, two more minutes, but uh, if there are no new questions, then I think we can move on. So we thank Larry for the effort of connecting again. Yes, yeah. and uh, for the Sorry. quite seamless <laughs> restarting of the talk, I think this is uh, quite applaudable. So it comments on the honor, so it's nice. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, so. We can move on to uh, oh, yeah, we can move on. Joa Pedro. Okay, thank you uh, very much. And uh, so, next talk is by Joao Pedro Santos Pieres, and he's going to talk about the density of states of 3D directional metals in the presence of extended impurities. Yeah, I changed the title a little ah, bit. Sorry. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes, and we have 20 minutes start now. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this, in this very nice talk. Uh, I'm here to present a work that we have done in the past months uh, in the University of Porto, where I am a PhD student. And the work is on trying to work out what is the effect of disorder in, uh, in the density of states of Dirac semimet. So this work was done in a, in a rather large collaboration with the people from, from the University of Porto, from University of Minho, University of York, also from Savancy University and University of Twente, and the, the University of Central Florida. So these people that are here. So first of all, what is a vial or Dirac semi-metal? Uh, I, I, will, I will not distinguish them very, very precisely in the beginning, but we can comment on that later. But usually we are thinking about some kind of analogous system to graphene, but in 3D. So it's like, it's, it's like this image. You have a, a three-dimensional space and you have a cone there. So you have uh, a Fermi surface that is, that is a point and, uh, or two points. 
so that it can be exactly the same as in graphene. And then in, the, in those points, you have uh, massless uh, excitations with, with isotropic velocities, right? So, but uh, when, we, when we go from 2D to 3D, there are things that change. Uh, so it's not exactly analogous to graphene. And in particular, we, we, we need to study how stable this is to, to perturbations. And what I mean by perturbations that is adding fields or adding parameters to my Hamiltonian. So we can start by analyzing a uh, two-band Hamiltonian, which can be generally described by this block Hamiltonian. This is the most general that you can have. You have no, no special symmetries here, which depends on three components of, of k vector, and then you have how many parameters you want, these lambdas. And now if you do this, and you, you can diagonalize it exactly, and what you obtain is a dispersion relation that looks like this, which means that if you want a band touching, so if you want to have sets of points, which can either be lines as in the previous talk or can be points, uh, where the gap vanishes, the gap is given by this minimum value, the minimum value of this, of, of this square root, you basically need to ensure that your, um, your f's, which are real functions, are individually zero for the parameters that you have. And the solutions of that system of equations is, is what gives you the, the, the points in the Fermi surface. The issue is that solving this problem is equivalent to basically taking in momentum space three surfaces which correspond to the zero energy uh, uh, level curves or level surfaces in this case of, of these functions f and see which intersections do they have. And they can have two intersections, they can have four intersections, one intersection, no intersection. But let's suppose as in the drawing that you have two intersections, those two points. Then uh, we, can, we can ask ourselves, okay, what happens to these intersections if I vary the parameters of the Hamiltonian? Uh, if, I, if I do vary them, what I'm doing, if, if these functions are continuous functions of lambda, is just displacing the, the surfaces. So these points will move and they can only be destroyed if they join together and then the, the surfaces decouple one from the other. So this is basically, obviously there, there are more mathematical ways of doing this, namely uh, calculating what is the, the flux through a surface that encloses a, uh, one of these vial nodes, uh, which are no, band touchings of only two bands or, or non-degenerate bands, is what we call topological stability. So these band touchings are topologically stable. The problem with doing this with two band Hamiltonians is that in general, three dimensional systems can, can uh, or, or even two dimensional systems, uh, can have symmetries that, uh, that uh, don't allow you to use just two bands. For example, if you have spin rotation symmetry, so if you have no Zeeman term and no spin orbit coupling, then directly you can see that your bands are doubly degenerate because of the spin states. But you don't, need, you don't even need that. You, if you have time reversal symmetry and inversion symmetry at the same time, as you can see here, uh, the same thing happens. So in either case, you have this degeneracy here. And this makes, makes the, the model a little, bit, a little bit more complicated because now you need to use a four by four matrix with two by two, by two matrices in, uh, in spin sectors. And a simplified model that you can have for a, what, what we'll call a Dirac vial system is this one that we have here, which has three parameters that break either time reversal or inversion symmetry, depending on, on which ones we are talking about. So the Bs break time reversal symmetry. And this model is very useful because it encapsulates several different cases. It encapsulates the case in which you have a band touching of doubly degenerate bands, which we call a Dirac semi-metal, if all the parameters are zero. But then you also have gapped systems. You can have either a gap Dirac or in this case, a magnetic gap Dirac uh, point because you have uh, broken also the degeneracy of the bands, of the spin bands. But you can have more exotic situations. For example, you can split the, the degeneracy in momentum space of the Dirac semi-metal and get, and get two uh, uh, nodal point vial nodes, which is this case, or you can have this case over here, which is exactly the same that, that was discussed in, in the previous talk, 
which is in the case in which the band touching is actually a line, in this case, a, a, a circle in momentum space. We, we are going to center on the Dirac semi-metal, which is not so topologically stable uh, because it is equivalent to having two uh, uh, vial nodes of, of opposite chirality superposed with one another, but it can still be stable by symmetries of the Hamiltonian because we are here talking about general Hamiltonians, but we can, we can impose symmetries on it. And uh, for example, in this paper, they, they, they argue that having fourfold axis, for example, or twofold uh, rotation axis in the symmetry group will stabilize these nodes. So they can be stable, but all of the arguments that we, that we gave, uh, topological or symmetry based, are based on block Hamiltonians. So they involve translation symmetry. So if we put this order, or in homogeneous perturbation in general, uh, this, this is no longer strictly valid, although we can have some indications of what happens in that case. And uh, here we are centering ourselves in, in the case where we have either impurities or disordered landscapes. That's why I, 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 I call these dirty Dirac semi-metals. And we are, we are focusing on bulk properties only. So the early arguments uh, about disorder in general said that basically in 3D it is irrelevant. And there are many arguments uh, on this. Uh, one that I particularly like is this one where you have, it's a very heuristic one, but uh, basically gives you the same results as a self-consistent point approximation or a, or a saddle point approximation for, for a field theory and so on, uh, in which you have an electron in 3D that is a Dirac electron that has a, a de Broglie wavelength that, that is given by this because K is, uh, E is linear in K. And then it's going through a, a rough uh, disordered potential, which we can take rather generally as a, a correlated potential uh, which is, has this correlator and it can have a characteristic distance so it can be short range correlate, correlated and if we do this uh, we can say heuristically that the electron will feel the fluctuations of the average potential in the volume that is defined by its wavelength and if we do this and use the central limit theorem, which will be valid provided this volume is large enough to contain many, many correlation lengths of the potential, what you get is that these fluctuations scale as e to the three halves, which goes faster to zero than the energy itself. So in, in, in the limit of low energy, so near the node, uh, the, the disordered potential will, will be subdominant when compared to the, to the kinetic. Uh, Hamiltonian. So this seems to, to, to indicate that the, the, phase, the phase diagram that we'll have for these systems is the following. And this was, was proven in more rigorous grounds uh, in, in, in the 80s, still in the 80s by Eduard Fratkin, uh, where you have a semi-metal phase, so a phase in which the node survives, but not only that, the density of states at zero energy is zero and then grows quadratically with, with, with energy because we are in three dimensions. And this semi-metal phase is preserved up to a certain critical disorder where it, is, where it gets, gets unstable and you start having a lifting of the density of states of the average density of states at zero energy. And then if you continue, continue to, to, to increase disorder strength, then you eventually end up with an Anderson, a usual Anderson insulator. Okay, and these, these claims were later proved for these systems, proved right by uh, numerical simulations in this, in this second paper that I have here. So they did simula lattice simulations for the Dirac semi-metal and they saw, okay, there is a critical disorder where the density of states stop being pinned down to zero there. And you have a phase diagram that even includes temperature in this case, uh, uh, which, which looks like this. So you have quantum criticality that is of the non-Anderson type. However, uh, actually, prior to this, this, to this work, one year prior, uh, other people uh, analyzed the problem in a different perspective. Instead of analyzing the disordered problem, they analyzed the case where you have diluted impurities, spherical ones, uh, and you have a continuum limit of, 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 the, of the Dirac Hamiltonian with a, with a single... Um, so basically, you are, you are, you are solving the, the single impurity problem, which can be a, a, a 
spherical well, but it's rather general. Just uh, if you put any short range or even uh, algebraic with algebraic tails, uh, you you get uh, you get uh, similar results. And what they got when they do this? Okay, they solved the, the, the problem, so they they found the eigenstates. And for non-zero energy, they found that they had scattering states. And by scattering states, I mean free Dirac spherical spinners, but with an additional phase shift that, that appears asymptotically, that is energy dependent. And in this case, we, we, we did the convention of saying that the phase shift has this signal, is the sign of E, uh, meaning that the phase shift is defined uh, as positive or negative, depending if you are on the on positive energy states or not. But at zero energy, usually they don't find any states. And in the clean limit, you don't find any state. So the, the, the equations don't have outside solution, uh, don't have solutions. But if you, put the, um, if you put the impurity, you can see that in certain special cases, you can have solutions and solutions like this. So you have a wave function inside of the impurity, but then outside you have an, a, a power law tail, which is long range, but uh, is long range in the sense that it's algebraic, but it's normalizable or squared normalizable in three dimensions. So these are bound states, which I call critical because they, are, they don't have a characteristic length. But these only happen if the parameters of the impurity have this property. So if they obey this equation. And this is obeyed only for very fine-tuned parameters of the impurity. So the product of the ratio by the, the strength needs to obey this equation. And then there were, obviously, if we want to take this into this problem, to take this, the solution to this problem and transport it to the disordered problem is a leap of faith because disorder is, is not diluted impurities. But surprisingly, there, were no, there was numerical work made by the same group as before, uh, numer uh, numerical work with Anderson disorder, unbounded Anderson disorder, uh, locally unbounded, where they found exactly that. They found that at zero energy, they had states. And what this means, basically, is that the phase diagram that I draw earlier, which is this one, is not true, actually, but instead you have this. So you have a diffusive metal in, for, for, intermediate, for, for disorders that can be infinitesimally small. You only have the semi-metal if the system is perfectly clean, and then you have the Anderson transition in the same way as before. Okay, so in this case, we have what, what, what they dubbed uh, avoided quantum criticality. So we decided to take on this problem and try to analyze it very carefully because we know how to calculate the phase shifts either analytically or numerically, depending on, on the model of impurity that you have. Uh, and these phase shifts gives us directly the, the density of states, uh, the extensive one, so not divided by the volume. And uh, the way you do it is by Friedel sum rule, well, as, I, as I wrote here. So in the diluted limit, so when you have very, very uh, uh, impurities that are very far apart, then they don't, they don't see each other. So the contributions to the density of states are expected to be additive. So you have something like this. And they can have different parameters. So this UI is just the product of the, of the radius and the strength of the impurity. And if you do this with spherical impurities, what you get is this plot like here. So this is near the first critical point. So the first point in which the bound states can appear. And what you see is that as you approach the, this critical value, you, you start having resonances in the, in the density of states near zero that gets closer, that get closer and closer to zero, get narrower, but at zero energy, it's always zero. It's what you get, what you have in the inset. And this was the argument that was, that was used by, in these two papers by, by Outland's group, uh, where, where they saw that, where they say, okay, at zero energy, uh, we have this, we have zero contribution, so my, my semi-metal phase will actually survive, even despite having this, this, um, these, these, these bound states. <clears throat> the problem with this reasoning, and this hence the however, uh, is that the phase shifts are not strictly defined by, by the continuity of the wave functions in the impurity boundary because you also have a, a gauge arbitrariness in the, in the way you define the wave functions, uh, which, which expresses itself in a, in a mod pi um, 
uh, ambiguity in the delta. So you need to define it in reference to something. And in this case, we define it in reference to the clean system. So we want to see how much the waves are defaced, spherical waves are, are defaced when, with respect to the, the system without impurity. And this you have is- four minutes left. Sorry? You have four minutes left. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm about to finish. Uh, uh, so you have, you, have this, uh, this, um, you have this condition in which, if you, which basically imposes you that the phase shifts will go to zero when your U, so when the impurity disappears everywhere in the spectrum at the same time. And if you impose this condition, you'll get plots like this for the phase shift. So you have here for the one half J equal to one half sector, J is the angular momentum wave num uh, uh, quantum number, and for J equal three halves in the right. And what you see is that at exactly the critical value, you get a discontinuity of pi in all the cases. And this discontinuity is formed by the, these approaching very steep uh, um, ramps that you have there, which are reminiscent from the peaks that we saw earlier. This discontinuity is actually to be expected because uh, it corresponds to something that is an old result uh, uh, on, on, on bound states, on counting bound states in Dirac systems, which tells us basically that every time I create or destroy a, a, a bound state in a, in a gap Dirac system or in a gapless in this case, you will have, you will have a pi discontinuity in the phase shift at, the, at, the, 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 at zero momentum. In this case, since we don't have any gap, we create bound state and destroy it uh, right away. So that's why we only have the discontinuity persisting for one particular U, but it's there. And if we have a discontinuous function, then how can we differentiate it? How can we use Friedel sum rule? So basically that's the point, is that you, you, this discontinuity, which is induced by the bound state, but it's a property of the scattering states, uh, it's an obstruction. It provides an obstruction to a, a, a normal use of Friedel sum rule at that energy. All the others are fine at that energy. It's not. And in particular, what we see is that we, if we take the limit, so if we go back to the derivation of, of Friedel sum rule and we take the limit uh, in uh, without without differentiating, so without making uh, linear approximations, we see that it forms a direct delta distribution near the critical use. And what this makes is a lifting of the density of states at zero energy. So this is what I show here. These are theoretical predictions from our continuum theory. So now the last question is, will our, our theory survive, survive being in a lattice? Because all the simulations are done in, in lattice systems. So by, by being in a lattice, I mean, considering, for example, this model, which is just uh, obtained from discretizing the Dirac Hamiltonian, this model will have eight valleys, so we need to take that degeneracy into account. And now we, we put a, 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 scalar, a scalar sphere there, so we just change the local potential. And what we get is that, uh, okay, if we look at only one impurity, which, which is what I have there, we see that the resonances that we get from the Friedel sum rule are there, as long as we have a sufficiently large the simulated cell and a sufficiently large sphere, because otherwise you have, you have uh, uh, finite side effects, and we are at low energies where our continuum theory is valid, so we don't have band warping. Uh, the curves that you have superposed there are basically the theoretical curves, but corrected by valid degeneracy, which is multiplying by eight, and uh, convoluting with a Gaussian so that we can take into account the, 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 the spectral resolution of this method that we used, which is the kernel polynomial method. Okay, can you and what about wrap up? Because we are, your 20 minutes is passed, so we have Okay, to... okay, yeah, it's my last slide. <laughs> so uh, with, with, uh, with multiple impurities, we have something similar to our, to our theoretical predictions. The difference is that if we put many impurities in the, in, inside the unit cell, we get deviations from the, the theoretical prediction, in particular from the linear scaling law with, with concentration. So this is just a, a summary. And I would like to thank the, um, this, these projects. And uh, if you want more details, we are preparing a publication. Thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you very much, Joao. So unfortunately, we do have too much time for questions. So uh, let me encourage you, both Joao and the audience, to be in the afternoon session. So we can we can make questions to the to Joao. So I have a couple of them. So I, I'm gonna ask you in the afternoon session if you agree. Joao? Yeah. No, I mean that if you are in the afternoon session, I can ask you a couple of questions about Joao. Okay, okay. I will be. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you very much. So let's move on. Let's move on. And the next speaker is Alvaro uh, Rubio Garcia, uh, who is going to talk about topological bulk states and their current theory and uh, observation. Uh, so uh, please, Alvaro, if you are around, yes, we can see. Okay, you. hi. Can you can you see me now? We can see. Uh, your... We see your your screen, but can you switch on the camera if you want? Could you please? Okay. I'll try. Um, okay, can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Alvaro Rubio. I'm a PhD student at the Spanish Research Council. Today, I'll be talking about topological bulk currents in churn insulators. So, what are these currents? Where do they come from? And how can we observe them? This work has been done in collaboration with uh, Chris Self and Janice Patchers from the University of Leeds, and also with Juan Jose Garcia Ripoll from the Spanish Research Council. This work has resulted in the publication of two articles in July of 2020. Well, let's start with the notion of a churn insulator. So a churn insulator is just a topologically non-trivial insulator, meaning that it is characterized by a topological invariant or a topological quantity which is in this case the churn number, new, which has to be different than zero. A churn insulator is a system that is a band insulator in the bulk of the system, but it has conducting edge states along the boundaries of the system. These are the edge currents. It is interesting to know that uh, for this, in order for these currents to appear, they don't need any magnetic field. This is called the quantum anomalous Hall effect, meaning that the transverse conductivity only depends on the value of the churn number and not on any magnetic field. The first example of a churn insulator that was discovered is the Halday model. This is a model that lives in an hexagonal, in an hexagonal lattice and has first neighbor couplings like in graphene. It has second neighbor couplings that break time reversal symmetry. And it also has on side terms that break inversion symmetry. And now by defining the interplay between the uh, uh, symmetry breaking terms, we can uh, define whether the system is in a churn insulator phase or whether it is just a trivial insulator. Well, what are these edge states? Let's suppose that we have our system embedded in a cylinder. So we have now two boundaries, this one here and this one here below. Okay, we know that we will have edge states that are localized at the boundaries of the cylinder. These edge states will give rise to edge currents these edge currents are chiral, meaning that one current goes in one direction and the other one goes in the opposite direction, and they are quantized, meaning that the intensity of the, uh, of the current depends on the value of the churn number. Because uh, it depends on the value of the churn number, which is a topological quantity, we know that the edge currents are also resilient against temperature and local disorder. If we were to look at the energy spectrum of the system inside the cylinder, these two bands here in the middle would correspond to the edge states. One band corresponds to one boundary and the other band corresponds to the other boundary. And how do we know that there is any current? Well, we measure the particle density flow. So we analyze the change over time in the number of particles at one side k, and we can decompose this operator into the set of all particle current contributions going from every side in the lattice to the side k. So we define the operator, the uh, current operator jkl, as the current operator, so as, as the operator that measures the particle current going from one side l to a side k. Okay, and now by choosing, um, by, by choosing to measure every current operator inside, for example, one boundary, we can also measure the total current along that, band, band, that boundary. And we can do that for whatever region we want. And this is what we will do whenever we want to measure any, any current in our system. Okay, 
so far, I have spoken about turning insulators in, a, in homogeneous potentials, so in constant potentials. But now what happens if we introduce an inhomogeneous potential? For example, let's say that we introduce a step potential like this along the vertical direction of the cylinder. Well, it turns out that in that case, we will get localized states in the bulk of the system. These states are localized at the step of the potential, so right in the middle of the cylinder. Uh, if we were to look at the energy spectrum, uh, these localized bulk states are these and these bands here. So they are outside the energy gap. It is very interesting to know that these localized bulk states give rise to localized bulk currents. So they are currents that are, that are in the bulk of the churn insulator. Well, how can we understand the origin of these bulk states? Let's say, let's make a, a minimal model. We know that we are in a cylinder and the cylinder has a, has a translational invariance. So we can Fourier decompose it into different momenta. Well, we choose one momenta, so the momenta uh, pi, and we add a very small potential step to the cylinder so that we can make perturbation theory with that small potential step. What we will get is a one dimensional SSA chain with complex uh, second neighbor hoppings which already gives us two properties of the bulk states. The first one is that these uh, bulk, so these states are localized at the step of the potential, so in the bulk of the system. And second, that these bulk states are outside of the energy gap. Well, how can we understand now the origin of the bulk currents? Well, we could think of the cylinder inside an homogeneous potential as if there were many currents that are counter-propagating, so they, they go in opposite directions, and they have equal magnitudes. And because they are counter-propagating and have equal, equal magnitudes, they all cancel out. But what happens if we introduce an inhomogeneous potential? Well, it turns out that in the regions where the potential changes, there will be a density imbalance of particles. This density imbalance will uh, will make that the magnitudes of the currents, they won't cancel out any longer. And because they don't cancel out, we will have a net current in the bulk of the system. So an inhomogeneous potential makes that, uh, makes localized uh, currents to appear in the bulk of the system. Okay, what are the properties of these bulk currents? First, exactly like its currents, they are quantized, meaning that they depend on the value of the churn number. And because they are quantized with a topological quantity, they are robust against temperature and local disorder. But the most important property, or the most interesting property, is that they are localized at the potential gradient. So they are tunable. This means that by only choosing the form of the potential that we want, we can also have whatever currents we want. This is something that doesn't happen with edge currents because in edge currents you have, your, you have your system, you have your boundaries, and your edge currents are always the same. Uh, to show this fact, we, uh, we show here a cylinder with a potential that it's like uh, this. So it has a form of a triangle. And we measure now the currents traveling through this red line. Okay. What we can observe here is that where the potential is constant, for example, here and here, there are no net currents. But whenever the, uh, the potential has a non-zero gradient, for example, here and here, there are bulk currents. So by choosing the form of the, grade, the, form of the potential we want, we can have any current that we want. OK. That was for the uh, theory part. So now, how can we observe these uh, currents? Well, uh, to do that, we will propose an ultra-cold atom experiment. An ultra-cold atom experiment consists on having cool atoms trapped into a laser field. This laser field consists on overlapping laser beams, which make up for the Hamiltonian part of the system, and an harmonic trapping potential that just keeps the particle in place. With this, we can simulate a very broad range of physics. We can either have fermionic, Poisson statistics, also uh, many, many lattices, for example, the hexagonal lattice, and we can even introduce artificial gauge fields. 
And actually, the Halley model has already been realized in the, in the laboratory five years ago. OK, what can we do with um, an ultra cold atom experiment? Well, we can take time of flight images. They consist on uh, releasing particles from the trap. We let them expand for a time t, and then we take a picture of them. By choosing the uh, time of expansion, we can get two measurements. Uh, if we only if we choose to let them expand for a, only a very short time, we will we can measure the position of also the density of particles inside the inside the lattice. But if we choose to let them expand for a very very long time, we can um, measure the velocity distribution of the particles inside the lattice. Another property of the time of flight images is that, is that we can choose uh, to release some very small regions, so or the regions that we want from the lattice. OK. So um, I said that in an optical atom experiment, you have an harmonic trapping potential that hits the particle in place. So what happens when you have the Haldane model inside an harmonic trap? Well, we assume that the, uh, that the harmonic trap is very wide. So uh, we assume that the local density approximation is still valid in our model. In that case, we know that our system will, will be divided into three re regions. We have a central region that is completely filled with particles and has no uh, topological, uh, is topologically trivial. Second, we have uh, a region which is a churn insulator, so it has churn number different than zero, and is at half filling. This is this white region here in the middle. And then we have an, an outside phase, which is uh, completely empty of particles and is also topologically trivial. Okay, what happens with the churn phase? So we know that this is a churn insulator and it is inside an harmonic trap. The harmonic trap has a non-zero potential gradient because it has a potential gradient, we know from the theory that it will have bulk currents. These bulk currents are, well, uh, this uh, green arrow here. Uh, because also the churn insulator phase is in contact with two non uh, non uh, with two trivially topolo with two topologically trivial phases, it has two boundaries. So the boundary between the white and the red region and the white and, and blue regions. And it will also have uh, conducting edge states or edge currents. So these two white arrows. <clears throat> OK, so what is our first proposal? Our first proposal is to, to make a short time expansion. So we select, we select a small rectangular patch in the lattice, and we let it expand for a very short time. And then we measure what is the density of particles in this region, and what is the density of particles in this region below and we compare them. When we do it, we, can, we will observe that there is, for example, an accumulation of particles here and an accumulation of holes here. This means that we have a particle current in this direction. And this particle current is actually the bulk current in the uh, bulk of the churn insulator. By similar reasoning, um, we can also find the its currents of the churn insulators, so here and here. OK, this is our first proposal. Now, our second proposal is to make a long time expansion. A long time expansion measures differences in the velocity distributions of the particles. We can, for example, select uh, to release particles only from the churn insulator phase, and we can measure their velocity distribution. Now, we, are, we do something very similar to before. Uh, we measure differences in the velocity distribution, so, and we compare them. By comparing them, we can observe whether there is a preferred velocity in that region of particles. And by doing that, we can find that there is, for example, in this region, a bulk current going in this direction. And also, by releasing, for example, particles in this region or in this other region, we can also sample uh, we can also measure the edge currents. OK, so to summarize, um, from the theory part, we have seen that churn insulators 
do not only have its currents, because when we introduce an inhomogeneous potential, we can have topological bulk currents in the bulk of the turn insulator. They also share many properties with the edge currents. They are, um, so mainly that they are topological and they are localized. But uh, it, different to the edge currents, we can tune the uh, bulk currents at will. So we can have whatever bulk currents that we want. Okay, and finally, from an experimental point of view, uh, we have made two proposals using uh, ultra cold atom experiments and time of flight images to observe both edge and bulk currents. Uh, I think this is the first proposal to, uh, to measure them, um, uh, to directly measure these, these edge and these bulk currents without uh, any synthetic dimensions or, or whatsoever. Okay, and this is the uh, final, uh, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, it's question time now. Okay, uh, thank you, Alvaro, for your talk. Uh, I think there are uh, there are actually a couple of questions. So, first question is by Elena Drike. I think Elena, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your questions yourself. Uh, Elena, I will ask her to unmute. Okay, I. I... Or do you see the question? Should I read it out? I can read it. So uh, uh, Helen, I can... uh, hi. Okay. Uh, my my question is uh, what happens if the potential step which induces these bulk currents is in the same position as a boundary region? So if it's right at the edge of the insulator, there would be these edge currents, and then you could also have the bulk currents in the same place. Can they add up or cancel? Did you investigate that? Uh, yes, in um, so if we have them in, if, if we have this step in the boundary, um, they will um, they will cancel out this this so they will add up these these currents. Uh, but you can treat it in a more simpler way if you have this step. Um, okay, so you you mean that you have your boundary side with one potential and then the rest of the lattice in the other potential. Mm -hmm. uh, if okay. Uh, in that case, they, they will just uh, add up because they are they are very um, um, close to each other, and they, they will just add up. Okay. So we you. didn't uh, really look for that, but uh, but they, I think that they they should add up. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. You're welcome. Thanks. So there is one more question uh, from Esteban. Uh, I think Esteban, you can also ask. Uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk, Alvaro. Uh, You're welcome. Do you have a, any localization measure for, for instance, uh, inverse participation ratio in the band structure just to check where yes. is the is this edge state? Yes, it, it's very nice that you are, that you ask me this this question because you also show a a spectrum which is something like this. So like, like the, the bulk states of my presentation look very similar to one spectrum that you showed. Um, uh, yes, we have some uh, measurements about the inverse partic participation ratio. They are in the in the two articles that uh, that we that we have. Uh, uh, you can so by measuring the inverse participation ratio we show that uh, the, both the edge states are localized and also the bulk states are localized. Um, I think it's not the most straightforward thing to, to show it now because uh, I wouldn't know how to, how to, actually where to find them and how to show them, but, uh, but they are localized, yes. We, we measured the inverse participation ratio and we, we saw that they are localized. Yeah, uh, my my question is if you have uh, any uh, any any kind of res resolution of where are they located? For instance, in the middle and uh, or yes, yes, they are localized. For uh, in the example of a potential step, they are localized exactly at the uh, at the step. So where the potential changes. Okay, so so if you allow me to to make a, a second question. <laughs> uh, does this depend on the edge uh, termination of this uh, graphene? Because I can deduce that this is a zigzag nanoribbon, no? Uh, 
uh, yes, it's a zigzag. Uh, we didn't uh, we, we didn't specifically uh, look for for those kind of properties. Uh, we assume that they are bulk currents and they're away from the edges, and therefore uh, the edges shouldn't have any measurable effect. But but we uh, didn't go looking for for that, so I cannot really answer you uh, in a specific way. About okay, no problem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Abaru, again. I, I think we can move on uh, to the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel de Jesus is going to talk about uh, disorder driven multifactorality transition in very modal loops. Please, Miguel, share your screen and uh, you can also okay. share. Oh, I, are you already seeing? Yes, we can okay. see you. And I think your 20 minutes starts now. And you are going to see my hands okay. raised if you are going over uh, 15 minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. I would like first to thank for, for participating in this very nice uh, mini colloquium. So I'm going to tell you uh, about our uh, work on uh, disordered vinyl loops, uh, which was uh, done in collaboration with professors P Pedro Ribeiro, Eduardo Castro, and Miguel uh, Araújo. And uh, let me uh, first start by making a brief review on topological semi-metal. So we have seen this in previous talks. Uh, uh, as you know, topological semi-metals are topological materials that, that are semi-metallic in, in bulk and uh, metallic in the surfaces due to the presence of, of surface state. And of course, some examples include Dirac or Val semi-metals in which the, the valence uh, and conduction bands touch in, in points in, in the blue one zone. Uh, uh, and uh, also nodal line semi-metals that we also uh, have seen in Daniel's and, and John's talk. In, in which uh, they, they, uh, the valence and conductance bands touch along a, 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 a line or a loop in, in uh, the Brillouin zone, so the Fermi surface is, is one dimensional. Now, around these, these uh, uh, nodal points or, or uh, loops or lines, uh, the energy dispersion relation is linear. And also, these, these types of materials have, have surface states, which in the case of, of the vile semi metals, uh, uh, the moment of these surface states fall within uh, arcs that connect bo uh, both vial nodes. And in the case of node aligned semi metals, we have these drum head states where the moment of fall within the region bounded by the, the nodal loop. Okay. So, what we want to do in our problem is, is to add uh, disorder, uh, uh, actually, uh, on site Anderson uh, uh, short range disorder to, to the, to the vial nodal loop. And uh, this slide was to uh, brief, briefly review uh, what uh, is known for the valve semi-metal, but this was already co covered uh, very intensively in, in John's talk, very nicely. And uh, so I, I will skip this uh, quickly. Uh, as, as, as John said, the, the first picture that emerged was, was the existence of, of this uh, quantum phase transition between the semi-metallic and metallic phase, where the density of states at the Fermi level is zero in the semi-metal and uh, becomes finite in, in the diffusive metallic phase. For an even larger disorder strength, we have a transition into an insulating phase. However, these, these uh, 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 new types of effects that, that John discussed, these uh, so-called rare regions, uh, uh, were proposed to, to spell this, this semi-metallic phase. So this is still an open problem. Even this year, uh, there were references that were released uh, in favor and against the, 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 the existence of this, this phase transition and, and John's, uh, talk, uh, John's uh, work should then be included here. Uh, okay, but we wanted, what we want to do uh, is uh, to add this order to the Val nodal loop, okay? And uh, let me start by giving you a, a very uh, a brief description of, of the phase diagram. And then we will try to understand why, why we obtain these phases. <laughs> So uh, what we have here is the phase diagram as a function of the disorder strength. And what we obtain is that there is a, this multifractal semi-metallic phase uh, at a low disorder, where the density of state at the Fermi level uh, remains zero. But this is, phase is very different from the clean, the clean limit because as the, it has these multifractal properties. And to try to explain this in, in short, what we can do is we can take the Fourier transform of the, the wave function uh, uh, in real space and we will uh, look at it in, in momentum space. 
And uh, uh, what we will see is that it is uh, uh, distributed in a Lorentzian-like distribution around the, the nodal line. So we can define the width of this distribution as this gamma. And if we compute this gamma as a function of the system size, uh, where if we consider the system just to be a, 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 a cube with length L, okay, we will see that this uh, uh, width goes to, uh, so decreases with the inverse of the system length in this multifractal semi-metallic phase. And only after a, a critical point, it becomes finite uh, and becomes system size uh, independent. And at the same time, uh, we, we seem to have this density of states becoming also finite. Uh, and so we, we have a quantum phase transition into this single fractal metallic phase, which is just a common uh, a 3D diffusive metal. Also for a larger disorder strength, we have seen that we have this Anderson transition. The pieces is similar to what we have in, in the case of the valve semi-metal. Now, before uh, uh, showing you the, the results, let me first <coughs> show you the specific model, the, the specific Hamilton that we uh, analyzed. So what we wanted to do essentially was to, to do exact diagonalization uh, uh, computations for, for this Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian on a lattice. And the first term here is uh, just the, the, uh, the term for the clean uh, vial nodal loop. So uh, we are writing it in momentum space and it was built in such a way that there is the valence and conductance bands touch along a single uh, uh, loop in, in the plane Kz equals zero. Uh, now, uh, if we take the Fourier transform of, of this C case uh, here, we get the tight binding model in real space with two sub lattices per unit cell. And we, what we did on top of that was just to add this uh, on site uh, uh, disorder, uh, which was different in both sub lattice one and sub lattice two. And where these, these variables VR uh, were uniformly distributed in, in a box distribution. Uh, so a bounded distribution with width W. So W here uh, uh, is the disorder strength, okay? Now, uh, let me start by showing the results on, on the density of state. And to, to, uh, uh, to obtain these results, we use the kernel polynomial method implemented in, in the Kite quantum transport software, which, is, which has a very efficient implementation and enables us to reach very large system sizes. For example, in these examples that I'm showing you, uh, we used 10 to the nine uh, unit cells uh, to, for the simulation. And let me start uh, by showing you this, this picture where we are, we are uh, 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 plotting the density of states as a function of the energy <coughs> for different disorder strengths and also for different numbers of Chebyshev moments, which is, uh, in other words, for different energy resolutions. So what you can see here is that for a large enough energy, the results are essentially converged uh, with the energy resolution, which means that we already reached the thermodynamic limit value. On the other hand, if we, if we are looking here close to, to zero energy, you can see that the results are highly dependent on, on the energy resolution, therefore they are not converged, we see, which is bad because we actually want to really study this, this zero uh, energy uh, limit. So what we did to, to try to circumvent uh, this problem was to define an energy window above which we considered the results uh, to be converged uh, with the energy resolution, and then try to guess what would happen for zero energy based on, on those results. And on top of that, uh, we realized that to get the finite density of states at zero energy, we expect the, the uh, derivative of, of uh, the density of states with respect to energy to go to zero as we approach zero energy. And we can plot instead this, this derivative, <clears throat> and we can do this as a function of this, of this order and reduce our energy here up to where we can, so up to where the results are converged. And what we see if we do that is this uh, crossing point here above which uh, this bra prime reduces as uh, we reduce your, our energy, which is expected in, in a metallic phase where it should actually uh, uh, go to zero at, at zero energy. But below this, the derivative actually uh, increases, which is compatible with the density of states that, that goes to zero uh, uh, at zero energy. So conjecturing that this uh, should be the critical point for the semi-metal to metal phase transition, we can extrapolate this, this crossing point into zero energy and compute uh, the numerical value of the critical point. Now, we also did some cross checks with exact diagonalization, so some independent uh, uh, cross checks, and, and we obtain a critical point which was compatible with, with uh, this one that I show you here. Now, uh, we, uh, we now move to the wave functions properties, which are perhaps the, 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 the most important results, but before showing you the, uh, this, the results slide, 
let me uh, define these quantities uh, 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 that will be important. So uh, let me start with the real space inverse participation ratio that you are probably familiar with, in which we just sum the, the absolute value of the amplitudes uh, of the real sp uh, space uh, amplitudes of the wave function to the fourth. And this uh, quantity should scale with some power of the linear system size. And based on, on, on this scaling, we can distinguish between ballistic or diffusive states for which uh, this uh, exponent should be the system dimension, or localized states for which there should be no scaling at all because the wave function is localizing in real space. We can define also a similar quantity in, in momentum space. Now we sum the, the, the free amplitudes also normalized. But in, and in this case, we define this exponent tau k. Uh, which can distinguish between diffusive or localized states for which the wave function is delocalized in momentum space and therefore this scaling should be with the system dimension or ballistic states for which the, the wave function is localized in momentum space and therefore it is zero. And finally, we can define this generalized momentum space IPR in which we just replace this, this four by this two Q which will define you an exponent that will be Q uh, dependent and this, this allows you to distinguish between these so-called single fractal states uh, uh, in, in, where you don't have any multifractality and you observe this linear dependence of tau k on q and also these multifractal states where you get a nonlinear dependence of, of tau k on q. Now, this is exactly what are we looking at here uh, to start with. So we are looking at tau k as a function of q and uh, what, what I'm plotting here in black is, is what uh, you, the behavior that you expect for a normal 3D diffusive uh, uh, metal. So, uh, um, and uh, this, as, as you see here, even though we also always observe this behavior for Q uh, smaller than one, you can see that uh, for Q larger than one, there is uh, uh, below some, some disorder strength, the exponent tau Q starts to approach this 1D diffusive-like uh, behavior. And this is really what introduces uh, uh, what happens in the low uh, disorder uh, phase. And this is what introduces this, this multifractality. So we get this uh, nonlinear uh, dependence. Now we can uh, try to understand why this happens in more detail. And to see that we can realize that uh, uh, in this uh, multifractal phase, the, the wave function is, is uh, located, uh, the, the, uh, the larger amplitudes of the wave function are located uh, around the, the nodal line. Therefore, we can define this, this width of the wave function uh, uh, around the nodal line actually in terms of the momentum space IPR that, that we defined in the previous slide. And if we compute uh, this quantity, we will see that in, uh, for, for low disorder, uh, the uh, gamma scales with the inverse of, of the system length, while uh, above some critical disorder strength, it becomes uh, uh, finite uh, 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 and system size independent. So we can compute a critical point to distinguish these two behaviors and see that it is compatible with the one that we obtained for the semi-metal to metal phase transition. So, so we conjecture that these were, were really the same critical points and there is just a multi-fractal semi-metallic phase for low disorder and a single fractal metallic phase, which is the normal uh, uh, metallic phase for, for intermediate disorder. But there is still a question, which is really what introduces the multifractality, which is we always observe these, these 3D diffusive-like behavior for Q smaller than one. And to understand that, what we can do is to plot the wave function uh, uh, for the, the entire uh, momentum space, not only the, the larger amplitudes. And what we will see is that there is a fraction of smaller, smaller amplitudes that spread over the rest of momentum space. And these amplitudes decay polynomially with the distance to the nodal loop, which is this k prime that I show you here. And more importantly, they decay with the inverse of the system volume, that is with L to the power minus three, which is what is expected for a normal 3D diffusive metal. So this behavior is different from what we see for these larger amplitudes that are spreading uh, uh, along the loop, which is one dimensional, and therefore we, they, they uh, scale with the inverse of the system length, okay? And how does this explain these results here? So uh, for Q smaller than one, in, this, in the sum that we defined in the previous slide, we are really giving more importance to these smaller amplitudes and therefore the 3D diffusive-like behavior comes about. Well, for Q larger than one, we are uh, giving more importance to these larger amplitudes and this 1D diffusive-like behavior uh, uh, emerges. Now, just to, to fi finish and compile all the results, what we did uh, was a scaling analysis. So I, I don't have time to get into much details on this, 
but we can define uh, 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 scaling variables uh, uh, bo uh, uh, in both phases, in both the multifractal semi-metallic and single fractal metallic phases, based on, on the wave function uh, we, that we uh, defined in the previous slide. And based on that, we can also define correlation lengths in both phases and see uh, how, how they vary with the distance to the critical point. And of course, with that, we can e extract the critical exponent nu. And also, uh, based on, on simple arguments introduced in this reference, we can obtain scaling expressions for the, the density of states. And with this first expression, we can extract the dynamical exponent z by fitting just the density of states. And with these two uh, uh, exponents that we extracted, together with the critical uh, value of the disorder strength that we obtained in previous slides, we can uh, uh, use this, this final uh, scaling form to uh, see, uh, to plot, um, to make a plot and see that this, all these curves collapse into two different branches, which would mean that, okay, one branch would correspond to uh, uh, one phase and the other to the other phase. And if we do that with these values, we see that the, these uh, curves beautiful uh, collapse into two, these two different branches. Uh, uh, so these are curves uh, as a function for different energy, density of states for, for different energies and for different disorder strengths, okay? And uh, uh, you can see that they, they, all these curves uh, collapse. And this, uh, this uh, branch corresponds to the multifractal uh, semi-metallic phase because for a fixed delta that is uh, 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 we, uh, away from the critical point, so inside a given phase, as you decrease your energy, your density of states goes down, okay? And the other corresponds to the single fractal diffusive metal for which as you decrease your energy, your density of states be becomes uh, uh, finite. Now, uh, just, conclude, just to conclude, we, we have seen, uh, observed the existence of a finite disorder semi metal to metal phase transition. But more importantly, we have seen that the nature of this small disorder uh, 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 phase is multifractal. So we dubbed it uh, multifractal semi metallic phase, which is a phase that is uh, very different from the clean limit uh, state. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you again uh, for the nice talk. And um, there are some questions from the audience. So there is a question from Joao. I think Joao, you can also ask it yourself. Um, okay. So uh, you you analyzed the um, the the IPR to to see to see how how the how does it depend or the, how, how does does the exponent depend on k to analyze the, this transition between multifractality and, and single fractality. But can you use that to see where the, the mobility edge for the Anderson transition lies at energies uh, that are below that transition? So if, uh, in, for the Anderson transition, you, what you would do is to look at the real space IPR. Yeah, but how does it translate to the, to the, to the momentum space IPR? Ah, there you cannot, I, I mean, you, uh, so for, in the Anderson transition, you will observe a quantitative value in the momentum space IPR, but the scaling will be the same because the, the, the scaling in the diffusive phase or in the localized phase will be of the, of this exponent. So let's look at, uh, so let's, let's look at this exponent here, this tau r. So, uh, uh, if you are, if you are, um, if you are, uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I, 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 I was misleading. Let, let me reformulate. So actually, you, you can obviously uh, distinguish uh, um, the, the, the Anderson transition with the real space uh, um, IPR. So um, in, the, in the diffusive phase, your, your wave function is extended in real space, okay? So this, this quantity should actually scale with, with the system dimension. In the localized phase, you, your wave function is localized in some region in space, okay? So therefore, you shouldn't observe any, look, any scaling of this quantity as you increase your system size, because your, your state will always be localized in, in some region in space, okay? So yeah, that's, yeah, you can definitely uh, uh, distinguish those, those two cases. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there is one more question. I think we can still ask it. Alberto, can you? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a very quick question. So maybe I missed the details. So uh, in normal semi-metals, I do expect the, the radius of the normalized semi-metal to play a major role because it's a dimensional full quantity. So do you see any feature uh, 
uh, coming from the, the presence of, uh, no, of this uh, radius of the normal line, because so, at the end of the day, is there, uh, I mean, it connects it, it, uh, opposite points. Yeah, it, it, won't, uh, uh, it, it won't change the, 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 the phase diagram. Perhaps it will change the value uh, a, a bit only. It, it can change, for, for instance, uh, uh, these slopes in, in the density of states. But, but the, 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 what we obtain qualitatively is this phase diagram. It, 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 won't, uh, um, it won't change. So that's, that's I, I mean, the main ingredients is, is, are really the, the existence of, of this loop. Uh, uh, of this nodal loop, where for a finite disorder we mix all, all the states in the loop, and, and we get these this, uh, multifractal uh, properties. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, we are running out of time for uh, still, so I think we have to move on to the this session's last speaker, Francisco Martin Vega, who is going to talk uh, about high magnetic field scanning done in spectroscopy and the type 2 where some metal that you have right. Okay, hello, can you see my screen, everyone? Yes. Okay, so let me set the pointer here and, can you and I will start. And can you also share your camera? I think I am. Let's try. But maybe I'm not highlighted or spotlighted or whatever. Uh, ah, no, no, yes, now you are. Okay. okay, so may I go? And yes, you can start your 20 minutes. Okay, so first of all, thanks to the, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present some, some of my results here. I work as a PhD student in the Low Temperatures uh, Laboratory at the University of de Madrid. And uh, today I'm going to talk about some, I want to show some STM results we got in this material, uh, Tungsten Dichloride. I'm going to divide the presentation into, into two parts. In the first part, we will see how we can measure the mass structure of a material with the STM using uh, positive techniques like cosmetic and deficit scattering. And I will present uh, the design of our homemade, or our homemade STMs, as well as uh, our low temperatures and high magnetic field setups. And then in the second part, I will introduce this material that is a topological semi metal with very unusual transfer properties. And I will show some STM results we, we obtained. Well, so just in case there's, there's someone that is not familiar with this technique, uh, roughly speaking, the STM consists of an atomically sharp tip typically metallic, although superconducting tips can also be used for some purposes, and the conducting samples that we're going to probe. Uh, we, if we apply a base voltage between these two electrodes, when they are close enough, electrons can tunnel from one electrode to the other, and this tunneling current decays exponentially with the tip sample distance. This distance can be precisely controlled using piezoelectric materials, and this way, for instance, if we apply a feedback loop to adjust the, the height of the tip as we scan over the sample to keep the current uh, constant as a, as a constant value, we can reconstruct the topography of the, of the sample. But uh, the STM can also be used as a spectroscopic tool. This is the expression for the tunneling current as a function of the bias voltage, where here we have the density of states of the sample and tip. And uh, if we differentiate this, I mean, if we are, if we are using a, a metallic, no superconducting tip, we can assume that the density of the state of the tip is constant. And then differentiating this expression, uh, we obtain that the tunneling conductance is proportional to the convolution between the density of states of the sample uh, and the, deriva the derivative of the Fermi distribution, that is this function here. If we are below temperatures, this derivative is tend, tends to a delta function, and we have something that is just proportional to the density of states of the sample. Something interesting we can do with the STM is to study the quasi-particle interference scattering. And if we have uh, impurities or defects the, on the surface, electrons are, are scattered around, uh, producing these oscillating patterns in the local density of states that can be observed in the tunneling conductance images with the, with the STM. Fully transforming these images, we can obtain the main scattering vectors and uh, the dispersion relation of the material can be reconstructed by uh, following these uh, scattering Q vectors in the STM conductance images at different bias voltages. This uh, scattering potential might be different for different types of defects and uh, the density of the sample can, I mean, it can also be anisotropic and so can be the this density of the state of the sample and we will see all of this in our results in Tasten and Dieter, right? Uh, with this method, we can reconstruct the, the band structure of a material for both field and empty states, and that's a major advantage if we compare it to techniques like ARPES that can only access states below the, the Fermi energy. Well, let's go to our particular design of the, of the STM. First of all, it's important to note that the higher you want to go in magnetic fields, uh, and the smaller is the, the inner diameter of the coils, so we have to reduce the size of our STM to, down to 30 millimeters, and we are currently working in an even smaller 3D printed version of just 16 millimeters. The main body of the STM is made of titanium, but uh, we have recently built this version out of SAPAL that is a ceramic material that, uh, that presents a quite high thermal conductivity. 
the tip is mounted on a prismatic tube, the tube that allows for the fine vertical and horizontal movement of the tip. And with, with these stacks of prismatic materials, we can move the tip macroscopically in the vertical direction. And there's, and the sample holder is mounted on a sliding piece that we can control from the outside. And this way we can mount more than one sample in the same sample holder. And more interestingly, uh, it allows us to clip the samples in cryogenic conditions. Uh, with layer samples, we typically glue a piece of alumina on top of the sample and um, we place a copper bar here so that when we pull in this direction, the alumina hits the copper bar and the sample gets exfoliated. And if we are dealing with harder samples, we can substitute the blade, uh, the, the copper bar, sorry, by a blade and we can directly cut the sample leaving clean surfaces to explore. The STM is attached to the, to the cold part of a dilution refrigerator that goes down to 80 millikelvin with the STM inside. And this particular system I'm showing uh, has a 17 Tesla magnet, but we have magnetic fields up to 22 Tesla in our lab. All the wires coming from the top of are thermalized in several stages, and they are twisted in these small coils in the bottom part with a to to improve the high frequency filtering. The cryostat is placed inside a this anti-vibration room uh, with, with a floating floor that isolates it from the pumps of the dilution system and from the rest of the vibrations of the building. We can extract the energy resolution of the system by measuring the BCS superconducting gap using an aluminum tip and an aluminum sample. And from the, this card was taken at 100 millikelvin. And from the width of this peak, we struck an, a value for the energy resolution of around nine microvolts, which is quite nice and allows us to study a wide variety of different materials. For instance, we have recently measured the superconducting gap in gold to lead. That is a, a superconductor that might present topological properties. And it shows a rather small gap of around 200 microvolts at 100 millikelvin. Well, let's go to our results in tungsten ditelluride. Um, this material presents the, the, the typical layer structure of transition metallic alkogenides with, with strong bonds inside the layer and weak van der Waals interaction in, between two consecutive layers. And uh, each layer consists of a sandwich of tellurium, uh, tungsten tellurium, with tellurium atoms forming these uh, zigzag chains along the eight direction, which, which gives the material a quite one-dimensional behavior. The lack of impression symmetry in these crystals result in a, in a difference between the two terminations of the crystal. Um, the position of the rhythm atoms is the same in both terminations, but the distance to the underlying tungsten plane differs from one termination uh, to the other. And depending on the cleaving plane, we can access one termination or, or, or the other. Electronically speaking, this material is a semi-metal with a very low density of states around the Fermi level and a huge mobility. It has recently attracted lots of attention due to its large non saturating magnet resistance. And the origin of this weird behavior of the magnet resistance is similar to that observed in a bunch of different metals and semi-metals, and it can be understood from a semi-classical approach. This is the XX component of the resistivity tensor. We take into account the contribution of electrons and holes to the resistivity. And if we are dealing with same, with, uh, same metals with very low density of states on the Fermi level, it's easier to find a similar density of, of uh, electrons and holes. And the magnetic resistance increases quadratically with magnetic fields and it eventually saturates. But if this compensation is perfect, there's a resonance behavior and the magnetic resistance goes as B squared with no saturation at all. And this is what seems to be happening in this material that presents some angular system that goes up to 30 million percent and 60 tesla with no sign of saturation at all. However, it hasn't been checked yet if the band structure of the material remains constant with magnetic fields and if this picture of electron hole compensation is still valid at very high magnetic fields. And that's one of the issues we try to, to address with, with our measurements, as we will see later on. And besides, in gap or nearly gap systems like this, uh, surface state can arise connecting the, uh, the electron and hole bands. And these surface states uh, might play a role in the essential behavior of uh, the magnetic resistance. In fact, as we will see in a minute, the band structure of, the, of this material presents a couple of electron bands and a couple of hole bands along the gamma x direction. And we have this uh, surface state connecting them uh, that have been predicted by the calculations and are corroborated by upper measurements below the, below the Fermi energy. Um, uh, however, it has, it's uh, still unclear if this surface state is topologically trivial or not, because this material has been predicted to be a, a type 2 by semi metal. And in non centrosymmetric systems like this, as you probably all know, a band crossing uh, gives rise to wild points inter instead of direct noise. And direct points, sorry, and these points can host uh, massless quasi particles that are called wild fermions. If band crossing is uh, perpendicular, we have the so called type 1 by semi metals. And if it happens in a tilted bar dispersion, uh, we have uh, this type 2 by semi metals. In this case, uh, we don't have a point like Fermi surface, but we also have the contribution of the ball banks in, into a surface. Uh, uh, Vile points appear in, in pairs of opposite chirality, and the projection of these vile points into the surface is connected by this surface state that is called Fermi arc, and it appears as an open contour in the surface, Fermi surface. Type 2 vile points have been printed to occur in this material at about, uh, about I think, 50 millielectron volts above the, the Fermi level. And uh, an R-like surface state have, or has already been reported by upper measurement below the Fermi level. But as I said before, it's still under debate if this surface state is topologically trivial or not. 
The crystals we measure were grown by the group of Paul Canfield in names, and they are of extremely high quality with a very high value of the triple R. And this is the magnetic resistance they measure up to nine Tesla, which is of the order of 10 to the five percent. That is huge. We clip the samples in cryogenic conditions using the in-situ slide that I described before, and these are the kind of surfaces we, we obtain. This is a topographic image taken at 100 millikelvin, and you see how the lumen atoms arrange forming these stripes along the A direction, and we can clearly distinguish the twin equivalent position of the lumen atoms. If we go to 14 Tesla, we see that the arrangement of the atoms uh, on the surface does not change with magnetic fields, and uh, as I introduced before, uh, there's a difference uh, between the two terminations of the crystals, but the position of the lumen atoms is the same in both terminations. This makes it almost impossible for us to, the, to tell in which termination we are just from topographic images, but however, uh, the orientation of this kind of triangular pattern we see between two consecutive uh, stripes is always the same for all the topographic uh, images we took. So we can conclude that no matter if it's top or bottom, but all our measurements belong to the, to the same termination. termination sorry. Well, this is the calculated bulk band structure uh, for this material with a couple of electron bands and a couple of whole bands along the gamma X direction. And this is the expected density of states from, from such a up and up and structure. Uh, as I introduced before, um, the at very low temperatures, that is indeed our case, uh, the, the tunneling conductance is proportional to the density of the state of the sample. And these are some of the conductance versus bias voltage curves we measure for different values of the magnetic fields. Uh, we can see that in this range of energies, uh, the shape of our curves is very similar to that of the predicted uh, by, the, by the calculations. And uh, more interestingly, we don't see any drastic change uh, in our curves in the density of states uh, up to 14 Tesla. This suggests that the, that the huge magnetic resistance uh, of certain this material is not driven by any change in the in the Fermi surface with magnetic fields. But to deeply explore the, the Fermi surface of the materials, we perform some quasi-particle interference measurements. For this technique to work, uh, we need to, to have some defects on the surface to act at scattering points, and you can see these wave -like patterns coming from the, the scattering of the electrons around these defects. The method we use is the following. We find a region with some defects, and we take, and we take a topographic image, taking a conductance curve at every pixel of the image. From this set of conductance curves, we can build conductance maps and fully transform these conductance maps. Uh, we, can, uh, we can access the main scattering vector and follow them with the, with the energy. We find a slightly different scattering patterns coming out for different types of defects. One is associated to these uh, vacancies and the other one to these bump-like features that we call interstitials. We perform this analysis in three different regions. Here we have both types of defects, vacancies and interstitial. Here we only have vacancies. And finally, here we only have an, an interstitial up there. These are the, the, the constant energy contours of the Fermi surface uh, inside the first Rilland zone, for, uh, zone sorry, for some uh, representative energies. And uh, they were started for the bulk mass structure calculations, and we can follow the evolution of the, of the whole and like, electron and hole pockets. Uh, from these contours, we can calculate the, the, spectra, the scattering probability maps, and these maps show very complex scattering patterns, and the evolution of this pattern is mainly one dimension and one dimension as already along, along Kx. Starting from negative energies, we see that the main part of the intensity is concentrated uh, in, the, in the middle with this kind of triangular shape, and as energy increases, the intensity spreads in this direction, and we've, we eventually reach a situation with three clearly separated uh, scattering clouds. We can try now. We can now try to compare our, our QBA data with, with these predictions, and again we see how different type of uh, defects can privilege some scattering vectors uh, over others. That can explain why, for instance, in this uh, in this cloud uh, far from the center is more clearly seen in the case of vacancies, or why this very complex pattern of negative energies is more clearly, more clearly resolved when there's an interstitial in the image. But far from that, the agreement between our data and the predictions is quite nice. Quite, quite nice. Sorry, we have this. Um, a very complex pattern of negative energies with this triangular shape that gradually evolves to a separated configuration at, at positive energies. But for a better comparison between our data and the experiment, uh, we can plot a profile along Kx, that is the direction with the main part of the scattering, uh, with the dispersion, you know, the dispersion sorry, occur. And if we do that for all the energies of the study, this is what we get. Here we can now mark the main scattering vectors we, we see. Uh, for each case, and plot them over the calculated bulk band structure, and this is what we get. And again, we see uh, that how um, uh, different types of effects can resolve better some bands than other ones. Uh, for instance, vacancies uh, can resolve this whole pocket that is perfectly resolved uh, when there's a back an interstitial in the image, but on the other hand, vacancies resolve this electron band better than the case where we only have interstitials. But again, far from this, the agreement between our data and the predictions is uh, almost perfect. And besides, it does not depend on magnetic fields, and we go up to 11 Tesla. This again is telling us that uh, the huge magnetic resistance is, is not driven by any change in the Fermi surface with magnetic fields, and it reinforces uh, the idea of a perfect electron hole compensation as the reason behind the, 
the huge magnetic resistance reported in, in this material. We can try to see now what happens with the with this surface state uh, because surface calculations predict a surface an arc like surface state connecting the projection of the electron pocket and the whole pockets into the surface, and um, from these spectral density maps we can calculate the, the scattering probability maps and this is what we get the scattering of, of one arc with itself produces this cross shape cross shape pattern in the center of the map, and the scattering of one arc with the other one produces this arc shape pattern from from the center. We see some features in our data here that could correspond to the, to the scattering between the arcs. Uh, we also see have some cross shape pattern in the center of some of the maps. But the truth is that we have very similar shapes uh, in, the scat in the bulk prediction of the same scattering Q vectors. So it's very difficult for us to tell if these uh, scattering patterns we see in our data are coming from the, from the bulk structure or from the surface state. However, we also see this, this feature in our data that kind of lie in between these two clouds in the scattering predictions and don't match either with the, with the bulk predictions. So this could be telling us that the K position of the, of the surface state is a bit different, or they could be related to the, to the different surface state missed by the, by the calculations. Finally, just to conclude, uh, if we go very high in, in, finding, in high magnetic fields, we we'll start to see quantum oscillations in the tunneling conductance. And uh, this, is, this quantum oscillation has only been seen in very few materials with DSTM, mainly in graphene, and some other direction metals like uh, calcium 3 arsenic 2 or bismuth 2, 2 selenium 3, and some pure, pure compounds like antimony or bismuth. And for this technique to work, we need to have very clean surfaces with almost no defects uh, so that electrons can complete full orbits without being scattered. So I want to make it clear that the region where, where we observe this uh, quantum oscillations are different from those, those presented in the QPI studies. These are the conductance curve at 14 Tesla and 11 Tesla. And you can see how the amplitude of the, of the oscillations is bigger at 14 Tesla. And also the, the separation between, between two consecutive levels also increases with, with magnetic fields. Interestingly, we see a, a spatial uh, dependence in the in the local in, in a phase difference of the of the curves, and this this spatial dependence I mean this this spatial dependence is, is, is very reproducible and it doubles the atomic periodicity, and uh, we we are still trying to understand the origin of this very weird phenomenon. And if you if you want to know more or you want to discuss about that, I, I really encourage you to you to, to visit uh, the poster of my colleague Raquel this afternoon. Raquel, sorry, <laughs> this afternoon, and I'm sure she will be glad uh, to to discuss all of this with you. But we were still trying to. To, to study the origin of this very very weird behavior of the local of the land oscillation sorry well so, so let me conclude with a, with a quick recap of the results we get uh, uh, regarding the density of states, we don't see any change up to 14 Tesla. And from QPA measurements, we can reconstruct the bulk bank structure. And we see that it's not, it does not change with magnetic field. What, what reinforces the idea of a perfect electron hole compensation as the reason behind this weird behavior of the matter resistance. Our QPA data is also consistent with an arc like surface state, and it could be revealing a new surface state missed by the calculations. And finally, we observe this, this strange local phase difference in land oscillations that double the atomic periodicity. And as I said, if you want to discuss more about that about this, visit us in visit Raquel in the poster this afternoon. So, well, all our measurements were group, were made in our in a group in Madrid. Uh, I would I'd like to give again a special mention to Raquel, who performs some of the high magnetic field measurements. Crystal growth and characterization were made by a group of Paul Canfield in Ames, and the group of Ryota Arita in Japan provide us with all the theoretical calculations. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francisco, for the nice talk. Uh, so are there any questions from the, from the audience? So, uh, so I, I have a, uh, a question which, which basically, it's, I, I'm, I'm a bit ignorant about uh, experiment. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, in this system, your fair, uh, your your band structure is a bit bit more uh, involved, let's say. So, a bit a bit sorry. Involved. So, I mean, if, uh, you you just said that it is quite hard for this system to uh, disentangle the surface spectrum uh, from yeah. the bulk spectrum. So, uh, uh, are there some other uh, systems where this can be seen a bit more? Uh, uh, more nicely, so. Uh... I mean, I mean the, the, the main problem with this material, I mean, STM, of course, QPI is a very powerful technique to resolve the bands of the material. Mm -hmm. But the problem with this material and with this uh, type two by metals is that um, you don't, I mean, you, only, you also have the contribution of the bulk bands into the surface. So it's, everything gets very, very messy. So it's very difficult to distinguish between the surface states and the, and the bulk. So, but with other materials, and this is a pretty well established technique, and you can resolve the bands with no problem in principle. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's. No, no, so, my question was whether, so this has this been done for some other ways where, where it is the band structure is a bit more fortunate and 
But I, I think, I mean, as far as I know, this is the only type two balsamic metal where, where we have uh, QPI measurements. Oh. We have QPI measurements in, in tantalum arsenic, that is a type two, type, uh, type one, sorry. And they, 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 they report the Fermi arcs and very nicely there, but here and things turn very complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so are there some other questions? So if there are no other questions, I think uh, it's 12.30. So officially we have reached the end of the session. And we would like to thank all the uh, contributors or the uh, speakers and for all the questions raised by the participants. We would like to ask all, uh, all the speakers uh, to, uh, to switch on their uh, cameras because uh, Alberto is going to make a picture. Uh, so we, we would like to encourage everyone and then just to uh, switch on the camera and, hey, so there's and smile. So Ramon, do you know how to select all the, all the speakers with a camera? You have to go to gallery view. Yep, I'm gallery. And then if everybody switches on their cameras. Yes, but yeah, can, so can, you, can you select only people? So can you move some, can you put all the speakers onto one page? That's the question. Uh, this I don't know. Uh, let uh, me see. I'm, uh, yesterday I, I saw this, uh, this option. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I, you can you can just make a picture, and then with the arrow move to the other screen and make another one. I guess I, I don't know actually how to do this. So I think we can also allow everyone else to uh, to make to activate their camera. So please, people, if you would like to have a nice yes. picture taken, then you should yeah. you should be able to unmute yourselves. Yeah. Yep. And please, everyone who is still in the audience, switch on the camera so we don't have these uh, em empty people in the uh, uh, in the gallery. Okay. So. Uh, Alberto, are you taking Okay, pictures? so just give me a sec just to prepare. Okay, you're gonna take a picture. So smile the this Okay, thank you. So that's great. So okay. So I think with this, the official session is over and we are all, we would like all you to come to the uh, afternoon session and uh, continue the discussions. And also we will have some time for the posters and the, and the live uh, uh, and the pre-recorded talks. So uh, uh, yesterday we, had, we sort of had a couple of minutes for uh, uh, everyone. So uh, please, even if you have a, a pre-recorded talk, have your slides ready so uh, we can, uh, have a discussion regarding your... Uh, also, we encourage people to, to watch the recorded talk. Yes, yes. Uh, we, you, you now yeah, have time to, Yes, you now have time to go there. And so please, everyone, uh, enjoy the conference. Uh, uh, Alberto is going to pay everyone uh, a meal who goes to the uh, <laughs> canteen. Yeah, they told me, yes. <laughs> And, uh, okay, so thank you everyone for, for being here and thank you everyone for attending. So I, I, we hope that you enjoy as we did uh, this session. So we, we hope to see you this afternoon. Yes, and also tomorrow morning uh, we can continue. Okay, so okay. see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.